All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> so we will call to order the Planning Commission meeting for this evening, Tuesday, January 14th, 2020, at 5 p.m., or shortly thereafter. Um, establish our quorum and adopt our agenda. So we, Amy, if you would like to do a roll call, please. Jim Nellen? Here. Mary Ellen Ramstack? Here. Hugh Zettel? Here. Jay Hubner? Here. Laird Salisbury? Here. Linda Waite? Here. All right, we do have a quorum. And if I could have a motion to adopt the agenda, uh, Amy, if you could confirm that it has been properly noticed. The agenda has been properly noticed. All right. I so move we adopt the agenda, Mary Ellen. Second, Laird. You have to remember to get your heads back once it starts. All right, all those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Public participation for non-agenda items. If you wish to express a concern or have a comment on a non-agenda item, I have two names on this. Nancy Goss. Is Nancy here? Okay, a non-agenda item. So you are talking not on the comprehensive plan and not on the Corey Bluff LLC. Correct. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Please state your name and address then. Thank you. My name is Nancy Goss. I live at 12020 Timberline Road in Ellison Bay. I'm a supervisor for the town of Liberty Grove, also chair of the Liberty Grove Planning Commission. I've had the honor of serving both positions for 11 years. I'm not here to speak in favor or against any agenda item. I am here, however, to advocate for education of all municipal or county legislators who deliberate on land use issues here in Door County. Most, if not all of us, are aware that Door County is unique in its substructure with karst topography and fractured bedrock as well as relatively thin soils. Most of us are not professionals or scientists in fields of geology or limnology. Forgive me if the following information is something of which you are already aware. If so, I apologize for the redundancy. There's an organization right here in Wisconsin which is comprised of a consortium of University of Wisconsin professors and scientists, all with focused areas of expertise in those sciences that can and do affect land use. They are precluded from making recommendations or judgments regarding any specific land use issues. They are scientists. They educate with the facts that their research has provided to them. Who can we trust more than our own UW professors and scientists? The organization is the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. Quoting from their website, they are, and I quote, part of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. We provide objective scientific information about the geology, mineral resources, and water resources of Wisconsin. Part of the organization's outreach is to, again I quote, communicate scientific information to the general public industry, government officials, and regional planners to provide decision makers with the tools needed to make informed decisions. WGNHS will come to your community to address your land use decision makers at no cost. It is my opinion that we, as those land use decision makers, have a duty to our citizens to avail ourselves of exactly this type of educational information. To that end, the Liberty Grove Planning Commission will be hosting a lecture from a member of WGH in WGNHS. Arrangements are already in the works. We invite you all to attend and would eagerly welcome your interest and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And I also have listed Mike Holly non-agenda item so it's not in reference to the comprehensive plan or the quarry bluff cup application my colleague all right so we'll move along a 
approval of our previous minutes. The plan commission met, um, members met on November 13th, 2019. I think you've all had a chance to look at those minutes. If I could have a motion to accept the minutes and a second. I move that those minutes be adopted. All right. And second by? All second. second. All right. Mr. Hubner. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, pending business. Uh, our 20 year comprehensive plan. The only reason this is on the agenda is to let you know that the final product is available online. Uh, if not already on the town of uh, Sebastopol website, it is uh, available from Bay Lake Regional Planning Commission, who we worked to uh, come up and update our comprehensive plan. If you also uh, click on that link, there's a very interesting story map that you can click on a specific tell area. It will tell you the zoning, classification, population. There's all kinds of tools out there. So that is the only reason that that is on the agenda. That is out there and available for our citizens to look at. Any questions on that? Comments? OK. Uh, and then proceeding to new business, discussion and action. We have the Quarry Bluff LLC. Request for a conditional use permit for establishment of multiple occupancy development and campground land uses on the following tax parcels, um, 02201, 1228, 25, 12, 12A, 12B, and then 02201132825112G, and 11P. We will follow this order. The applicant will make its presentation, followed by questions of the plan commission. We will then open the floor to public comment, and then we will close public comment, and plan commission members can have their discussion and make their recommendation. As, our mis as Mr. Chairman um, stated earlier, this is a business meeting. No cheers, no jeers, no applause. Um, be respectful of uh, the time limitations that we have so that everyone does have an opportunity to um, state their case. So one person speaking at a time, please. And again, respectful of um, each other's um, time. So we will start with that. Would there be any rebuttal then or just present and then present and then that's it? No, I don't think we're going to have any rebuttal. So you, applicant presentation questions and answers from the plan commission open the floor to the public and then we close that and then just discussion among the um, not to say that we might have additional sure. questions for you after that so the floor is yours I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself yes. sir. thank you thanks Linda um, I'll start by introducing myself and then the other members of the team here will introduce themselves my name is Pete Hirth I'm a professional engineer in the state of Wisconsin. I am the president of Bodwin Surveying and Engineering in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, Bodwin's moved to Sturgeon Bay in uh, 39 years ago. I have been working at Bodwin's since 1995, so pushing 25 years now. We are a full service surveying, land surveying and engineering firm. I've been involved with projects throughout Door County as well as throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, some of our specialties at Bodwin's include on-site large wastewater systems and rural development. Uh, I've got clients that are in the Milwaukee suburbs that I've done quite a few conservation subdivisions for over the years. I've done commercial developments along the I-43 corridor in Sockville. We've been involved and had either surveying or engineering aspects of, I would say, the majority of the development in Door County over the last 25 years. Um, I moved to Sturgeon Bay in 95. I built a house on Bluff Court Trail in the year 2000. Uh, my house is two-thirds of a mile as the crow flies from this project. So from the quarry, I am northeast of the quarry, two-thirds of a mile. I have two college-age kids. They both went through the Sevastopol School. I was on the plan commission here at the town of Sevastopol in the mid-2000s and was involved in the meetings as the comprehensive plan was originally 
prepared in the mid 2000s, so I'm, I am familiar with that. Uh, Renee Borkovitz is running the PowerPoint for me today. Renee is a professional engineer as well. She is an employee at Bodwin's. Um, Renee has been integral in the development and ongoing approvals for stormwater and a lot of the CAD work, design work, and did help put together the PowerPoint that we're going to be showing you today. Uh, Renee also lives in the neighborhood. She's about a mile and a half from the quarry site. I'll turn it over now to Mike Parent and Tom Gells to introduce themselves. My name is Mike Parent, one of the developers, born and raised in Door County, lived in Bailey's Harbor, Sister Bay and Egg Harbor, worked in family excavation, site work development business in Door County for over 30 years. Uh, the business was started by my grandfather in the 1940s, carried on by my father until the business was sold in the year 2000. From the 1970s until 2000, the family business was the largest company of its kind in Door County, employing upwards of 100 employees. The company was involved in excavation, site work, blasting, crushing, utility installation, trucking, landscaping, and septic, septic installation. Also involved in numerous other developments, either as a contractor or an owner. Since the sale of the family business in 2000, I've been doing other development work in Door County, as well as owner of a company called H&K Sports Fields, designing construction of sports fields and sports complexes in the upper Midwest. I have a master's degree in construction management from Purdue University, licensed master plumber, and a licensed realtor. My name is Tom Gells. Uh, I've lived here for a little over 40 years, live up in Fish Creek. Uh, I've been developing and building stuff for about 25 years. I did uh, Mariner's Point and Sister Bay, uh, North Haven and Fish Creek, Fox Hollow and Fish Creek, Brooks Farm and Egg Harbor, as well as uh, developing new projects in Milwaukee and Florida. Um, like I said, I've been at this 25 years when 2008 came. We, uh, we ran into some very strong headwinds and um, eventually worked through all of it. Um, I uh, currently run the, I'm the, the uh, property manager at North Haven. Um, most developers can't seem to get far enough away from the, yeah, and the associations. They, they tend to typically separate. Uh, I've been there for 20 years. I still I, I work with those people hand in glove. I, I've been very familiar with uh, all forms of property maintenance and, and um, property management. Uh, so as the stuff gets older, you know you have to stay after it. Um, I've had experience, you know, experience working with architects, engineers, general contractors, um, marketing people, all the relevant trades. Um, this is a this is a well experienced team. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that, uh, I mean, that covers the, the basics of who I am and, and what I've done. Um, Pete, do you, uh... So the way I've set up the presentation is my, uh, my, my talking points will certainly follow the PowerPoint that's on the screen behind us. Um, I know the, the plan commission can see it. If members of the audience may have to turn if you want, I will try not to blind the people in the front row with my laser pointer. Um, we're hoping to get through our portion. I'm going to go through a detailed outline of the project. I'm hoping to get through that with, with, us, with us speaking within an hour. It may be optimistic. Um, if the board has something that you need clarification on, feel free to stop me and, and ask the question. Um, if we can get through the, the bulk of the presentation, and then I will certainly open up for all the questions and hopefully have the answers, answers for you as we go along. I will start by reviewing the zoning, the comprehensive plan, and then get into the actual look and feel of the project. I'll then finish with an overview of the engineering and the permitting aspects. So the town was sent the packet from the county, and the town is tasked with completing the town recommendation form that was provided in your packet. We will attempt to satisfy all aspects of the zoning and engineering requirements to allow you to complete that form supporting this project at the end of the hearing. 
So the process, as I understand it, is the town will give a recommendation. The county then will have another re resource planning committee meeting. And at that meeting, we will again present the project. There will be public input at that time as well. So the, uh, I'll start with the zoning history of the project, and this will show up on the screen. So the abandoned quarry was zoned recreation by the town in 1976, so 42 years ago it was zoned recreation. The zoning was renamed to recreational commercial in 1995. The parcel has been zoned RC since 1995. The slide shows the areas of Sevastopol zoned as RC. These are the areas defined by the zoning for a reason. So when you look on the map, anything with a pink color, here's our project, here's pink, pink, um, those are zoned and designated for commercial use. We're not asking for rezoning. That's a big deal on this project. A lot of the projects I work on do require rezoning, which also requires hearings. In this case, the zoning is in place. We're not asking for anything special as far as the zoning perspective. We are meeting the letter of the law as the property is currently zoned. So if you look at the, uh, the next slide, this is a blow up of the area. So our project is this area. You can see on the zoning map that anything in yellow is zoned SF20, which means 20,000 square foot lot. Anything zoned in the purple here is small estate zoning. And anything in the blue is a five acre zoning. So that's an estate zoning. Again, anything pink would be our project. I believe that's Birmingham's bar. This is the golf course and lands adjoining the golf course. There's some uh, commercial, I believe, up here that is the Little Harbor Inn. So what this map tells us is, based on that zoning, that is what you can expect to do with your property. For example, if you own 10 acres in a state zoning, the zoning code says you can have two five-acre lots. So if, if, you, if you own 10 acres in this area, and you go to the county and say, I want to do two five-acre lots, they say, sure, that is what it's zoned for. So for the same example, we're zoned RC. We went to the county and asked to do this project, which meets their zoning. This site is not mapped as preserved land in the Farmland Preservation District in the, in the Door County Comprehensive Plan. Again, our project here, the green area is the areas that are mapped as Farmland preservation, for obvious reasons, those are the areas that are pri primarily farms right now. Anything outside that area is mapped as not being farmland preservation. The map to the right side of the screen is the comprehensive farmland preservation uh, preserved lands. Our project is here. It is not highlighted as being a preserved land on the comprehensive plan. So in 2006, I was on the plan commission here. Um, we went through extensive meetings week after week, month after month, and came up with a smart growth plan that was developed for the town. The comp plan specifically identifies specialty zoned areas. The following language is in the town's comp plan, plan as well as in the RC zoning description in the county land division ordinance. It reads, recreational commercial zoning. This district is intended for Door County resort areas, particularly areas where high concentrations of recreational uses are located or are appropriate. These areas are not intended to develop into business districts, and thus many retail office and service uses are restricted or prohibited in favor of recreational uses such as golf courses, ski resorts, multiple occupancy developments, marinas, and restaurants. The comp plan goes on to also outline the importance of property rights. Language in the comp plan reads, throughout the development of this plan, landowners have expressed their desire to see property rights protected. Those rights have been respected to the greatest extent feasible throughout this planning effort. This plan illustrates planned development patterns for all property owners to understand and, to, and use to make their own personal development decisions. Basically getting back to my talk about if you're in a five acre zoning, you have 10 acres, it is your decision to split that into two, two five acre lots. Uh, as far as property rights, the Dreitzers, who are the, owner, the original owners of this property, have paid up, upwards close to $100,000 in taxes over the last 28 years. 
The comp plan also states that community character shall include character of the people. It reads, community character is defined by a variety of sometimes intangible factors, including the people living in the area, the visual character of the area, and the quality of life and experiences offered to residents and visitors. The character definition includes a good base of retirees to help with cultural and educational activities. I will now discuss Act 67 as it pertains to this project. Act 67, we'll hear a lot about Act 67 tonight, I'm sure, from both sides. Act 67 has an impact on the approval process for this and all other conditional use permit applications in the state. Wisconsin Act 67 was implemented in 2017 as Assembly Bill 479. To paraphrase, the Act requires the town or county grant a conditional use permit if an applicant meets or agrees to meet all of the requirements and conditions specified in the relevant ordinance. The Act's goal was to eliminate the denial of permits based on merely personal preferences, speculation regarding if the project is or is not contrary to public opinion or popularity. The Act's significance triggered a text amendment by the county zoning ordinance. So the red line um, zoning code on the screen that Renee put on the screen, that's Act 67. The red line document reflects the senior, the county's senior zoning administrator's changes that that Act 67 imposed on the ordinance. This was a major overhaul. The change as redlined reads, the resource planning committee shall review each conditional use permit application for compliance with all requirements applicable to that specific use and to all other relevant provisions of this ordinance. The committee's decision to approve or deny the conditional use permit must be supported by substantial evidence. With the following old language, you'll notice, is crossed out in the ordinance. So that was removed, this following quote was removed from the ordinance. In approving conditional uses, the Resource Planning Commission also shall determine that the proposed use at the proposed location will not be contrary to the public interest and will be detrimental interest to the public health, public safety, or character of the surrounding area. So that was intentionally removed from the ordinance. The goal of this change was to eliminate subjective evaluation and insists on only objective measurable facts when acting on a conditional use permit. This is a big deal for this project. These text amendments were unanimously accepted by all 19 county board members present at the 3-27-18 meeting. County Corporation Council, so the county attorney, his name is Grant Thomas, he issued a memo of clarification regarding Act 67 impacts to quote his review, there is a paradigm shift regarding zoning committees and board of adjustment. Must understand that the level of public support or opposition for the proposed use, which used to be leveraged in these proceedings, matters not a whit if the support or opposition is not backed by substantial evidence. This means that a conditional use approval is not intended to be a popularity contest based on the number of signs and yards, the number of signatures on a petition, but merely whether or not the application satisfies the prescribed zoning ordinance. Our submittal packet, which you've all seen, almost 500 pages, I believe, certainly meets all zoning requirements and has had rigorous review completed by the county to ensure its completeness. County staff has indicated to me that this is the most complete and comprehensive application they've ever seen. I will now discuss the property's history. On the screen, we will show that the Dreitzers originally purchased the property in 1992 based on future potential of the site based on the zoning in place, which was recreation. The attached plat book from 1985 shows the 195 acre parent parcel that was owned by Dewey Concrete, subsequently purchased by the Dreitzers in 1992. I was able to also find a 1999 plat book in my office, and on the 1990 plat book it shows the Dreitzers still owned 102 acres after some initial phases of residential development. The first several phases of development of the overall parent parcel include the extension of West Whitefish Bay Road northerly and splitting off many of the residential lots on top of the escarpment and along the shoreline. The overall intent was to develop the parent parcel in phases with the final phase to be the repurposing of the quarry floor. Many of the lots directly above the quarry were created in the mid-1990s. Dreitzers had explored the possibility of a large condo resort on the current project area in the early 1990s Dreitzers had listed the property for sale on and off since the mid-1990s. Dreitzers assisted the county in creating Penny Park Boat Launch by donating lands to allow shifting the highway easterly into their parcel to allow more room for the park, the boat launch, and the public parking lot on the east side of County B. 
I began meetings with the Dreitzers and developers in 2014. I've roughed out at least 10 different concepts for the Dreitzers and developers. Everything from duplexes to single family to multifamily. We reviewed which uses don't require any hearings through an over-the-counter permit. Some of those uses include boarding houses, employee housing, uh, dwellings for agricultural and processing employees, conservation subdivisions, and duplex development. We looked at access options from the top of the bluff, from the bottom of the bluff. We looked at individual wells and holding tanks. We looked at tiering the site for an upper and lower level. We reached out to contractors regarding reopening the quarry to provide dimensional stone for shore stabilization. All options were put on the back burner based on cost, feasibility, and market conditions. The proposed project was analyzed starting in May of 2018. Our first submittal to the county to verify the project fit zoning was over a year ago. We've worked with the county to make sure every letter of the law was met, resulting in the 500 page application you see today. So under the RC zoning district, this site, if it was a different development, we could have up to 378 rooms and we are proposing 230. And we could also, if someone wanted to develop it strictly into a campground, it could have up to 720 sites versus our 117 proposed. The developers decided that the proposed use is not only more attractive than other easier alternatives, but also makes more, is more saleable and more unique. Okay, now to the fun part. Um, what exactly are we proposing? I live near the site, I've seen the signs, I've read the Facebook bashing. Unfortunately, there is a lot of misleading and factually wrong information being pushed by the opposition. We hope to clear some of the, up some of the misconceptions in the next 10 minutes. Number one, what is a motor coach compared to an RV? We are proposing class A only motor coaches. An RV can include anything from a pop-up camper to a bumper pull to a motor coach. We are only proposing class A motor coaches. So there's a picture of a class A motor coach on the screen. Price ranges for class A motor coaches are approximately 200,000 to well over $2 million depending on what you get. I did a quick Google search. Here's a 2011 for 1.1 million. This one's also over a million dollars for a 2012. Throughout the country, there are upscale motor coach facilities. The motor coach crowd typically winters in the south and prefers summers in the Midwest, upper Midwest to escape the heat. There's currently a lack of suitable facilities available in the upper Midwest. Most motor coach communities have a designated rig parking area as well as an adjacent permanent home a central clubhouse and other amenities such as pools, pools and tennis courts. There's currently no facility catering specifically to and capable of supporting a Class A motor coach enthusiast in Door County or for that matter in Wisconsin. This project will open the county up to this specific demographic. What is the demographic, you may ask, and should we be concerned about the impact to the feel of Little Harbor area? Our research shows the following. Based on, on this research, 87% of the owners of motor coaches are over the age of 45, 72% are over the age of 55, 38% are over the age of 65. 50% have incomes over $100,000 a year. Not bad considering half of them are likely retired. This indicates that this is a very high net worth individual moving into our community. This appears to be a similar demographic to many of the people opposing this project. Another misconception is the quarry being described as a jewel of the county worthy of preservation. This is a picture of the existing quarry floor as it sits today. The quarry is gated off due to safety and liability concerns. Anyone currently using the quarry to enjoy as a recreational op opportunity either as permission from the Dreitzers or as trespassing. The quarry is an abandoned mine site with vast areas of exposed rock and piles of rubbish. With the exception of the vertical faces of the quarry walls, the upper plateau is not visible from Highway B. So this is a picture from the Pinney Park. You can see the, uh, the vertical face there. So the top of the shelf is what's being developed. That is on top of the, the vertical face you see. Instances of dumping trash and old appliances, including refrigerators, have been reported by the owner into the quarry. There are vast growths growth of poison ivy and other invasives on the site. The quarry has been used as a fill site for construction spoils over the years. Trespassers and young people partying have been reportedly dangerously close to the sheer bluff. I will now show you a 30 second video 
of me driving around on the quarry floor to give you an idea of the current state of the quarry. I spend a lot of time up on that quarry since we started this project. We've walked it many times. My opinion is that it is not very attractive as it sits today. What are we proposing? The site plan here shows 117 proposed Class A motor coach sites with the ability for each owner to place their own home on their site. The community will be gated. The community will have an extensive list of covenants, restrictions, and architectural guidelines assuring the aesthetic quality of the project. There will be a clubhouse, pool, picnic areas, pickleball courts, a park area, extensive landscaping, and outdoor patios and kitchens at each home site. There will be lined storm ponds for aesthetics as well as stormwater management. The following renderings show an idea of how potential build-out will appear. So on these uh, um, renderings, we had an outside company take the actual topo from the site and our proposed CAD files, and they developed some renderings for us to use not only to inform the public, but also to use as a promotional items in the future. So this would be the view from down below. This would be the view from above, from looking uh, easterly from above the bay. This is a little bit closer view. So as you can see, this is the face of the wall you see along Bayshore Drive, and this is the secondary bluff face uh, to the upper tier of existing homes. <coughs> A little hard to see, but there, there, we do show 117 units around a proposed pond system that would ultimately overflow this way. Each unit would have the capability of, uh, of parking a motor coach as well as a, a small home for that lot owner to use. This would be the lower tier, which is existing today, that would be used as a recreational area for pickleball courts, tennis courts, things like that. This is a rendering of what the entrance may look like going up into our project. I will show you later exactly where that is. This is the recreation area. This is an idea of, of what the uh, motor coach facility and the small houses may, may look like. And this is a concept plan that basically we use to do the layout. Um, as you can see on here, this would be our internal road we would construct. This would be the, the motor coach parking area with room to park their vehicle behind. There would be outdoor kitchens, uh, intense landscape areas, and then an area for the home footprint, which is 1,200 square feet. The individual homes that would be on the site would be a maximum of 1,200 square feet on the, floor, on the first floor. There would be no manufactured houses, no mobile homes, these are high-end, custom-built stick homes. You'll hear testimony comparing this site to Hearthside Grove in Petoskey, Michigan. That's a fair comparison. When I got involved in this project, I decided I'd better go to Petoskey to see what, what I'm getting myself into as far as design and what the opposition may, may have as far as a problem. When I was there, I, I shot a video and I'm going to show you this video. It takes about one minute, but, but this video, I think, speaks louder than any kind of testimony I could provide. It shows exactly what a finished product may look like on our project. And let's just take a look at the video real quick.
This is a much different picture than the opposition is portraying. I was there on October 5th. It was a Saturday, fairly busy tourism season at the beginning of fall colors. It's a very neat development. I actually, it actually has over 180 sites. Our, ours is proposed at 117. The lots in Petoskey that you just looked at uh, average around 6,000 square feet. Ours average around 9,000 square feet, so will be 50% larger lots. I left there very impressed. I would have liked to talk to the residents, see what their life story was, and see how they got into the motor coach life. It, I was very impressed. I left there thinking, what is the huge opposition? This is a great development. Um, it inspired me that this was a good thing, and uh, that's why we're here today. But uh, I can't imagine of a quieter, more desirable demographic. I can't imagine the incredible impact this will have on local businesses. You know, major beneficiaries of 117 people on top of the bluff would be every restaurant within 10 miles of there. It would be incredible. Golf courses. We know how golf courses have struggled in the county. Um, this would be a, a shot in the arm. Marinas, shops on 3rd Ave that go in and out of business. All the downtown restaurants, bars, not to mention during construction, the home building trades, the road builders, sewer contractors, well contractors, material suppliers, suppliers landscapers, hardscapers, repair shops for the, for the rigs. This would be a private community with no need for town plowing of the roads. I see no major added expense from a town level. We're not asking for any money from the town or any other public entity. This is going to be privately funded. And that leads to the real estate, real estate tax impact uh, Renee has on the screen there. So with our conservative estimate of overall value at full build out, the taxes paid would total around $428,000 per year. Town's direct portion would be around 37000 annually. And I noticed on my recent tax bill, we do have a school to pay for, and that would certainly help. This de development will provide a deeper pool of retirees to assist with nonprofits, local charities, churches, and volunteerism. Following a few more photos of my Petoskey trip, I'll flip through them. There's a typical, typical site that's just plain concrete. Uh, some people choose not to build a home, and that's what their site ended up looking like. There's a small home next to a pad. You can see the outdoor kitchen area in Pergola, which is very common. There's a motor coach parked in their drive. Stamped concrete, some people choose. Pavers, everything's well landscaped. Outdoor kitchen. There's typically, as you drive through the, the subdivision, what you'd see. Uh, you can notice they have a rolled curb here. We'd actually do a concrete curb. We'll get into that later. There's their gatehouse. It'd be a gated community. There's just a look of the streetscape within the project itself. There's a look at uh, their storm pond and aesthetic pond, which we would be doing very similar. Ours would be larger than that. The, uh, another look at some stamped concrete. Um, so what we did is we took the object objection letters that were submitted to the county and we compiled the summary on, on the, sh on the uh, screen here. And we're going to run through, now we're going to get to the part where we run through all 17 zoning items that are in the application. And we're going to attempt to, to prove that we satisfy all 17 as well as the objection letters that were, were submitted. I'll have Mike Parent here. Um, deal with item number one, which has to do with the impact to the property values. Again, most of this information you have in your packet, uh, the number one item is whether the proposed project will adversely affect property values in the area. In your packet, we had two studies. One was a, was a real general study basically explaining how external factors uh, could affect a, a property value or property values of adjacent owners. The second report, a more in-depth one, was a commercial development that showed 20 years prior and eight years after an office and retail development. Again, we're looking at commercial, uh, but we did look at that report and how it did not affect neighboring property values. Uh, one quote in that report, perhaps most surprising is the lack of evidence for negative and significant impacts of commercial development on, on housing values. Scores of political arguments to the contrary are voiced at local debates across the nation. The third report, which 
you just received this afternoon we forwarded we just we just got it um, it was specific to this project uh, the report was prepared by a company called forensic appraisal group they're out of Nina they've been in business since 1944 they specialize in property valuation impact studies expert testimony and real estate valuation the, the report that they prepared for us looked at similar projects in the United States where a Class A motor coach with a living arrangement uh, development. In summary, the report states, considering all factors as reported in this analysis, it has been concluded that the impact of the Quarry Bluff development project is, and they named three things, there is no evidence that this project will negatively impact the surrounding single-family property values. There is no evidence that this project would negatively impact the local economy. There is no evidence that a stigma to surrounding property values will be caused by the development once in place. Number two. whether the proposed use is similar to other uses in the area. Now again, it's unique because of the motorhome uh, aspect to this, uh, but we can base this on, there's 350 acres zoned RC within 2.5 miles. There's 22 acres zoned high density within two miles. The number one reason why it's similar, we're creating a seasonal vacation home occupied for several months of the year, very similar to neighboring homeowners. If you travel 4,300 feet to the north of the project, you'll see 43 individual homes, basically one home per 100 feet. It's basically the same density that we are, are looking at in the development. Things that are not similar, there won't be 100 driveways, there won't be 100 septic systems, and there won't be 100 wells. We will have two driveways, one septic, and two wells. The second aspect that makes it similar would be the demographics of the people in the development will be very similar to the surrounding people in the neighborhood. So item three on the conditional use permit list is if the project does or does not conform to the Door County Comprehensive Farmland Preservation Plan and adopted map. So I did touch on this earlier, but as you can see on the screen, it clearly is outside of that farmland preservation area. I'll now get into wastewater disposal system, which is item four on the criteria. So if we pop up the overall site plan, I can show you that the, the, the property naturally slopes from the north end to the south end. So there's about half a percent of natural slope, which works to our advantage because I can get gravity sewer with the high point being here to run both ways around our road loop, down the hill into one centrally located holding tank. So we won't have any lift stations within our subdivision. The sewer would be a municipal type um, sewer that is would have eight inch sewer for the mains with a manhole every 400 feet or at change of direction that would be approved and reviewed by DSPS in Wisconsin as a private sanitary main. The holding tank itself, which is located at the bottom of the hill, we'll show you a blow up now. So the, the site was determined, uh, we missed a slide there, John Teichler, who is the county sanitarian reviewed the site and, and determined that indeed a holding tank is the only way to go for this based on the existing quarry being stripped. So the holding tank at the bottom of the hill would have its own private access off of um, Bayshore Drive. The tanker truck would pull in back up to the tank and this is where the tanker truck would fill up. So what we tried to do is strategically uh, locate where the holding tank would go. It's uh, located 77 feet as shown off the edge of the road. It is shown 470 feet to the closest residence, which is a, better than a football field. And it is gonna um, be required to have intense landscaping with, with evergreen trees to buffer it per Door County zoning ordinance. The tank itself is a precast 40,000 gallon tank. Um, 
tanks have come a long ways in the last 30 years. Steel tanks were a thing of, are a thing of the past. They would uh, rust out, and if, if there's still steel tanks in the county, they've been getting replaced by concrete tanks. This is a concrete tank. We use this supplier for many, many projects for large <coughs> wastewater. That tank will be delivered in one day and set in the hole. It's uh, obviously watertight. It can be te pressure tested. The uh, one single point where a, a pumper truck would come in and, and haul. We're, we're anticipating while when the project is completely developed and it's full, we'd have about two pumper trucks a day hauling waste out of there. Very similar to Westwood Shores, Bay Shore Inn, Landmark, things like that. Um, the difference is we have a provided separate access. It wouldn't be intermixed with our residents and it wouldn't be intermixed with, with any of, it wouldn't be parked along the edge of uh, Bay Shore Drive. The next item is water supply. We're proposing two wells on the system and those two wells would be reviewed by the DNR. So we approached the DNR several months ago with a, a submittal packet that we interpreted the site to be an other than municipal public well, which follows NR 811 rules. The DNR then came back and said, no, because of the transient nature, it should be an NR 812 high capacity private well, not an other than municipal with less restrictive standards. <coughs> then we were informed by the DNR, no, we want you to go back to the other than municipal public well. So we did that. We will obtain a DNR permit. Um, that permit will require uh, quarterly monitoring and testing for whatever parameters they deem necessary. The, uh, the well, it's the, with the two wells themselves would be located where the highlighted areas are on the screen here. The, the well construction, because it's in Door County, it has a little different rules than the rest of the state. So state code on a limestone well would require 100 feet of steel casing that is grouted. In Door County, due to the uh, escarpment, same as your well at home if you're on the escarpment, you would have 170 feet of minimum for casing and grouting of your well. This would be a six inch um, drilled, six inch well. So the, the slide on the right is from geology and groundwater in Door County. This is kind of the Bible of, of wells over the last 30 years. What it does is it shows on the chart on the side, it shows what the aquifer capacity is and what the minimum ca casing depth is. So if you look at our project, it's a little tough to see exactly, but we're somewhere over 100 gallons per minute capacity in the aquifer, up to possibly 400 gallons per minute. And uh, the well casing depth, like I said, would be 170. So on the county GIS site, they've implemented the groundwater aquifer contours. So you'll see two contours here, the green lines here and here. So that one, I believe, says 600. This one says 590. So what that is indicating to us is that the groundwater under the earth is traveling in this direction, as my arrow points out. So our project here, any underwater aquifer is flowing from east to west toward Green Bay. Our proposed well design would have two wells, each one um, needing to pump a maximum of 85 gallons per minute. Uh, therefore, my discussions with Mark Euclid, local well driller, is that this would be easy to get water, it should be good water, and there should not be any drawdown of aquifer based on the, his experience of excessive aquifer capacity in that area. Item six is solid waste. So, what we're gonna do on this project, which is a little bit different than most projects I work on, usually you do dumpsters and you do an enclosure with a wooden fence to keep it out of sight. But in this case, we're going to actually put the dumpsters within a shed. So this is what they have at North Haven, which works out well. It looks like a, a, a garage, and inside are your dumpsters. What this does is it prevents birds, it prevents um, other critters getting in there, it keeps the sun off of it in summer, it keeps the stink down, keeps it out of sight, it's, it's definitely the way to go. 
We, and then we contract with a professional hauler to remove that waste as needed. The next item is item seven, and Mike will spend a little time on this. It uh, has to do with odor, dust, and construction. And uh, turn it over to Mike here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, this is item seven, would be odor. There is a possibility of two main sources of odor in this development. One would be the campfires. Um, we are not going to be allowing any camp, uh, wood campfires in the development other than one uh, out near the main lodge. Um, otherwise, all campfires will be natural gas. So that um, should not be an issue then as far as odor. The second odor would be the holding tank, uh, the pumping area for the holding tank. Now, there's going to be a few things that we would do. <clears throat> um, one would be considered a, a push pump that would actually pump uh, the effluent into the, uh, the tanker truck quicker, meaning it would get filled up faster and out of the way. Also a vapor recovery system, uh, meaning that any air get that gets displaced out of the tank as it's pumped uh, would be returned back into the tank, which would minimize the amount of odor in the air. There's other options out there, uh, carbon filters or a misting system that if this doesn't work. I've been in contact with a couple of consultants and they said there's, there's plenty of options out there to make sure that the order is contained uh, from that holding tank pumping area. Um, noise, uh, one, of the, one of the items that we talk about would be the noise that's generated in the development. The noise will be handled in three ways. There'll be landscaping, uh, trees, shrubs, berms will partially absorb and reflect noise. Um, I've got some additional information in the packet that talks about how landscaping would, would uh, take care of a portion of that noise. The other thing would be create white noise by waterfalls, water fountains, that type of thing would be creating a background noise which would muffle the other noises that are being generated in the development. The biggest thing would be quiet hours uh, monitored by the management group in the development that no noise after a certain time, uh, no noise early in the morning. Uh, so that would be the third way that noise would be um, controlled. Dust. Once the development is completed, there will be minimum dust uh, generated. All roads will be paved. Patios will have pavers. There will be lawn areas. So the dust actual act after construction would be minimal. We do realize that there would be dust during the construction phase with blasting and crushing. Um, it's a responsibility of the blasting and crushing companies to provide necessary measures to control dust. They be monitored by MSHA, OSHA, and Wisconsin DNR. Um, there's different types of uh, uh, mechanical means to control dust, vacuum bagging systems, filter systems, as well as water misting systems. Um, technology has come a long way, and with the issue of uh, silica exposure, it's definitely something that would, everybody would be aware of. And again, the company's doing that work would be responsible for meeting um, any requirements by the uh, governing bodies. I do want to talk a little bit about blasting. I know it's a big issue on this um, because of the concern. I want to take a few minutes here and talk about that. Blasting is not unique to our project. Majority of the people in the room have had blasting done on their property, either for a septic tank or a basement. I personally have 30 years first-hand experience in, in blasting in our family business. Um, also, there's other companies that had blasted when the economy was strong and there's a lot of money available. A lot of blasting took place in the 70s and 80s. Um, over, the, over a period of time, over 30 years, we blasted for holding tanks, basements, utility laterals, quarry blasting, marina blasting. We even blasted for cherry trees um, uh, for wood orchards a few years back. Um, we did have a, a, a blasting report produced for us specifically for this project. We hired a company out of Chicago, and they looked at the distances to adjacent property owners, looked at the depth of the, uh, the blast, and they came up with a, uh, a pound per delay um, when blasting takes place. And basically what this meaning is that there's certain guidelines when you blast that you can only cause so much vibration. And in the report that they prepared, I had a local blaster review the report and said it's very easily to fall within the uh, suggested load limits to make sure that damage is, um, is not done to the local property owners. 
There's other things that are done during blasting, pre-blast walkthroughs, post-blast walkthroughs, seismographs are set up. So there are other things done to minimize any issues that would arise from the blasting. So Um, one other thing on the blasting, I took a look at where our sewer main trench would be in comparison to the edge of the, the drop-off bluff, and we're at least 100 feet away from that edge, and uh, we're at least 100 feet away from neighboring property lines along the, the secondary bluff to the, the properties up above. I'll now move on to uh, safe access. That's one of the items. That's item 8 in your packet and in the conditional use permit list. So what we did is we took a look at, uh, there's, there's actually three entrances, only one of which will be used by the, the common person. So as you know, that right now there is a very steep driveway with the gate on it that goes right up the hill toward the quarry. So that will be preserved for fire trucks only as emergency secondary access. This is the uh, holding tank pumper truck access. That's access number two. And the main access is on the far south. That would be the main entrance for the motor coaches as well as visitors. So what I did is I ran a safety stopping site distance calculation at each one of the three entrances. And not to bore you too much, but based on what you can see when you're pulling out here, the uh, stopping site distance when traveling from the north is safe at the safety, uh, the emergency access up to 45 miles per hour. We have 372 feet, you can see. And from the south, it's fairly unlimited. We could go have a car coming from the south, 65 miles per hour, and still see the, the emergency vehicle leaving there. Here's a picture from that entrance looking both north and south. As you can see, there's, there's pretty decent sight. The holding tank access, which is here, is called driveway number two in our analysis. From the, uh, from the north traveling south, it's safe up to 55 miles per hour, and from the, the south traveling north, it's up to 65 miles per hour with over 800 feet visible. Again, those pictures show, standing at that location, uh, how safe that would, that would be to pull out. Third access would be the main access. <coughs> so this would be the main entrance up into our project. The, uh, the good news is that is the best of the three, and that is over 6,500 are 65 miles per hour in both directions, uh, over 728 feet for a stopping site distance. So the stopping site distance is based on reaction time, coefficient of friction on the pavement, and the speed of the car. You can analyze how long it takes that car to stop. As far as uh, the slope going up into our project, Oh, one other point on that, with, with the accesses and everything internally served by our private drive, we wouldn't have any equipment parked down on Bayshore Drive, which is very common as I drive to and from work every day. There's always landscape trucks, dump trucks. Ours would be using our internal drive. So I looked at the steepness of the slope going up into our project, and what I do is the, the approach onto County B, you want to flatten that so cars waiting to turn out are on a flatter surface. So I did that at 1% or 2%, and then I have about 5.5% going all the way up the hill, which will, will require some rock removal. But I made that 5.5% going all, up, all the way up into our project, which is a very safe slope. Um, I wanted to compare that to the neighborhood. So I took a look at Bayshore Heights, just to the south of our project. It's at about 7.5% slope. Bluff Drive, going up from Birmingham's, is about 8.75% slope. Bluff Court, going up the curve. The steepest part is about 10.5% slope, and Dunn Road, and the steep section is about 10%. So we'd be about half the slope of, of what you're used to on Dunn Road and Bluff Court. One important uh, thing that I think is misconstrued is the, the motor coaches, when they get to their site, they hook up sewer, they hook up water, they, they pull their awning out, and they're there for the duration. The, these motor coaches are not going to be coming in and out daily. The same people, once they park them, they typically have a secondary car, and that's what they're taking to town and to the restaurants. Um, the motor coaches, a lot of them will, will show up once in spring and stay until fall. So 
again, the, the risk of this is going to be a whole bunch of motor coaches coming in and out. We feel like the majority, once it's developed, are going to, to simply come there, stay as long as they're, they would like, and then leave one time. It is a hassle to unhook everything and, and, and move the motor coach. Um, I'll turn it over to Mike. He had uh, hired an outside traffic study company, Robert E. Lee, another engineering firm out of Green Bay, to take a look at what impact this would have on Highway B and the capacity of B and uh, if this project is, is going to be a problem. Like Pete said, we hired a company called Robert Ely and Associates out of Green Bay. They have a couple of engineers that specialize in traffic studies. Uh, they looked at the current traffic volumes and how this <clears throat> development will affect traffic volumes. County B is a major rural collector road by definition by the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. It's under county jurisdiction. Uh, the most recent traffic counts that were available shows uh, in 2015 shows approximately 1,500 cars per day traveling on County B. Uh, by the year 2025, at a conservative rate of growth, that should go up to possibly 2,000 cars per day. In talking with the engineers, the capacity of this road is 12,000 to 15,000 cars per day before additional lanes must be added. The Institute of Transportation suggests that a development we are proposing will add approximately 330 trips in a peak 24-hour period at full build-out. Again, they base this on 115 houses being built, which again, historically in developments like this, it's closer to 70%. Um, looking at County B, again, in their study, they feel that 70% of the cars will go south towards Sturgeon Bay. 30% of the cars will go north to Northern Door County. Looking at that ratio, 230 cars per day would go south and 100 cars would go north. Uh, 231 cars going south is a 12% increase in the 2025 uh, projections for traffic. By, by DOT standards, a 12% increase is considered a minimal, uh, minimal uh, uh, additional cars on that road still has plenty of capacity to uh, before any type of road changes would have to be made, construction type changes be made. I did meet with uh, uh, the county highway commissioner twice, three times actually, once on the site, twice in his office, provided him with all the information that we came up with. Uh, in his review, he didn't see any issues with what we're proposing. Um, the road was, was rebuilt several years ago. Uh, it's built to standards of a rural collector road. Um, the maximum weight limit on that road is 80,000 pounds. An average uh, Class A motorhome is 33,000 to 36,000 pounds. So it's less than half of the weight that the, uh, that the road can handle. And I think that is it. Uh, one thing, Renee, if you could, I know it's not in order, but if you could pull up that bike map off the GIS thing. One thing that we, we didn't, weren't going to originally touch on, but um, I think it's important to talk about is, I, I know there's concern about additional traffic and people using County B as for running, biking, walking. Um, the good news on our project is if you look at our internal road loop and the road up and down the hill, we've got about a mile and a quarter of internal roads. And um, experienced Tom specifically at North Haven said that people who live in that community simply walk the loop and that's, that's their exercise. I feel as if at least internally, people are gonna tend to probably walk our loop rather than going down onto Bayshore Drive from our project. Um, the other thing is the bike route itself on, so on the county GIS my map, they have a layer that has the designated bike routes in Door County. So in actuality, with our project being here, the bike route is mapped as going up Bluff Court, traveling down and going back down the hill by Birmingham's on Bluff Drive. So our section of Bayshore Drive is not even on the designated bike route as currently mapped on the county GIS site. All right, I will move on to uh, 
turn it over to Tom. He's going to talk about emergency services and access. He had met with the, the fire chief. I met with uh, Sturgeon Bay Fire Chief Tim Deitman uh, several times, actually. Um, and a couple of things that, that uh, we, we worked together, we, we located uh, where a dry hydrant is going to go. We'll be putting together an agreement with them. It's an all-weather uh, uh, access that they will have uh, to be able to suck water out of our pond throughout the winter. This, uh, he was thrilled about this. This will help him, he said, to fight fires in the whole neighborhood, uh, including, I guess, if anybody here's house uh, has trouble. So at any rate, um, they, you know, in the summertime, obviously, they can just go down to the park, but, uh, but then not in the winter. The turning radiuses for the vehicles is, well, first off, as Pete mentioned, the slope of the road is not, not it's only about half of what Dunn Road is, so the fire trucks will be able to get up and down, no problem. The turning radiuses are set up for these large motor coaches, which are as big, if not bigger, than the largest uh, fire trucks. So again, as a result, everything works. Um, fire Chief uh, Deitman was very, very pleased, and he wrote us a letter uh, indicating the same. Um, so I guess uh, in, in that regard, you know, we're, we're well covered, and again, helping the rest of the neighborhood out. Item number 11 has to do with uh, stormwater and surface water management. Um, this is a big part of what we did at Bodwin's regarding this project. This, uh, we're still working with the DNR to obtain the land disturbance permit. The DNR has a, a strict set of guidelines that we must satisfy on all large projects, and, th and this one for sure. The, uh, the DNR staff is getting a lot of pressure from the opposition. We've had multiple phone calls from them. Um, they are being very thorough. They are requiring things that I have not seen on other projects in Door County. Um, we do projects up and down the peninsula. A lot of them have to do with shallow bedrock. The difference here is the, the, the shallow bedrock has already been stripped of the soil, which we typically have a foot, two feet, three feet of soil over the top of the bedrock. So what I need to do, which is, is part, of, part of this process, is once we get an RPC approval, the county would then do a formal stormwater review and approve our plans in concert with the DNR staff. So we're working through that. The DNR has come back and forth several times on our design calculations. We feel like we've got it nailed now, and we are, we are anticipating an approval. Um, they even want us to hire a geologist now to take a look at the underlying rock, which is something new that we have never run across yet, and hopefully not setting a precedent for all future development to incorporate a geologist into a stormwater plan. Um, so anyways, what are we doing to help stormwater? What are we doing to not pollute the groundwater? What are we doing to, to manage it and to meet all strict DNR and county rules? So. If I take a look at the uh, overall grading plan of the site, which I understand you're not going to be able to read all of it because it's on a large scale. But again, the, the site slopes from north to south. We are proposing to surface drain all runoff from our project using a curb and gutter on the roadway. So we chose this way to manage stormwater rather than open ditches for the simple reason of if it hits the curb and gutter, we can direct 100% of the dirty, supposedly dirty road runoff into a storm pond for treatment rather than counting on a ditch, getting it there, which it may soak into the underlying bedrock. So it's very important to note that curb and gutter was added to this project specifically to make sure that dirty storm water reaches a storm pond. Another thing we're doing is there is a Right now, there is basically no cover, as you saw in the video, over the top of the existing exposed rock. So when this is all said and done, based on the grades and the existing slopes, I was able to manage about a foot, two feet of uh, fill that will be brought in on top of the existing rock when it's all said and done to provide filtering. So the filtering would certainly, from a yard area, from the pictures we saw from Petoskey, that filtering would allow water to soak through from the backyards. Again, all the road water reaching the pond directly by curb and gutter. Um, 
one thing, <coughs> the good news again is that it does slope and it allows me to take these roads into the pond, anything from the backyards into this pond, and then everything overflowing into a pond down on Bayshore Drive. So the way that, so what are these ponds all about? The, these are big ponds. The, the best way to meet DNR requirements is we have to meet one year to one year reduction in peak flow. We need to meet two year to two year reduction in peak flow. And we need to prove that we have 80% suspended solids removal from a stormwater event, assuming sediments get created from a stormwater event. So how do we do that? That the best way to get the suspended solids reduction is to do a wet pond. So what is a wet pond? A wet pond means that there's gonna be a permanent level of water. Um, minimum for the state is five feet. We're proposing 10 feet. The state gives us no additional credit for the additional depth. The program tells you it's the same percentage if it's five feet or 20 feet, but we're gonna provide at least 10 feet so we know they're not gonna freeze out. They stay cleaner, easier to manage, better for the dry hydrant for the fire department. So some of these ponds, we may even go deeper. There's, there's pockets I have on the main big pond that we're anticipating they may be 20 feet deep. So how do we keep the water in there? We use a, what is considered a type A liner. So the DNR has specific code requirements. Type A is the same as basically a landfill. Type B is a little bit less restrictive. Type C is basically putting topsoil in the bottom. So depending on what your project is, you get assigned which type liner you need to use. Being that this is in a bedrock area, the DNR has asked us to use a type A liner. So that will be a 60 mil HDPE, high density polyethylene liner. A 60 mil is pretty rigid. It's uh, thicker than like a plastic milk carton. Um, it's a black material that gets welded in the field and it gets placed in the base of the pond <coughs> to assure that the water is being held in the pond and the, the good news about an HDPE liner is 20 years from now, let's say something happens and there's a leak, you can find a leak because the water level will drop to that. You walk the perimeter, you find the leak, you do a patch. It's a weld. So again, it, it's, it's a very, I, I haven't done many type A liners on stormwater plans and I've been doing them in the county for 25 years. So this is a, a bulked up liner, we're okay with that. Um, the other thing we're going to do is create the peak flow reduction that the DNR requires. So what we're going to do is water is going to run into the big pond. It's going to leave out of a three inch hole and then a larger pipe with an overflow structure here lead into this pond. Same thing here, a three inch hole, a three inch hole out of here that'll run down into here, a three inch hole out to here. It'll find its way to an existing culvert that crosses Bayshore Drive. So when you talk about peak flow management, basically you, you don't want a large amount of water because we added roads and building pads. We don't want a large amount of water just to leave the site uncontrolled. You want to detain it in a detention pond and then you want to slowly release it. It's kind of the bathtub theory is what we call it. If you had a bathtub full of water, if you dumped it over, it would create a big problem. If you run it out the drain in the bottom, it slowly releases the bathtub, it controls it, it, it prevents any damage downstream. So anyways, so the DNR requires a one-year reduction and a two-year reduction. Uh, the way these ponds are sized so large, we actually have a 100-year uh, reduction that our model shows right now with no controls off the uh, bedrock surface, there would be 109 cubic feet per second. And after it's developed using all our outlet structures and the, and the great volume, we can reduce that number to 16 CFS. So it's, whatever that works out to, six times less um, peak flow than it currently would be during a 100-year storm. One other thing I want to show, these are just pond details, kind of showing how the ponds would be constructed with the outlet structures, the wet pond, we have safety shelves in the wet pond to make sure if somebody would walk into a pond um, that they would be able to stand up on the safety shelf until they're knee deep. Uh, each pond, each of the three ponds has its own detail. That's all been submitted to DNR. The other map here, this is an interactive map that, that is just kind of a, uh, for tourists. And it shows all the developments and things to do in Door County regarding restaurants, uh, hotels, all that stuff. And as you can see, 
development on top of the escarpment is nothing new. Every one of these dots on here is signifying some kind of development on the Niagara escarpment. All good. <laughs> so the next item, item 12, is size and scale compared to the neighborhood. So Mike talked a little bit about this and the neighbors to the north and south with the smaller lots in Little Harbor. Um, one thing we can, uh, one thing I looked at was the nine specific lots, homes right above the project. I know they have the greatest impact. Um, one of the homes is owned by Mrs. Dreitzer, and two of the vacant lots are also owned by the Dreitzers. The development will be, will be visible from their homes unless some landscape measures are completed at the edge of their bluff. I understand that. Their view to the water will be preserved, basically, however. So I've got some pictures. Uh, let's, let me get a little back one here, Renee. So here's our project site. These are the nine homes above. So what we tried to do is when we had the renderings done, based on the, uh, the grades, this would be a view from one of the yards. As you can see, this would be our development here. As you can see, based on the actual elevations <coughs> and contours, the lake view would still be preserved. From another one that's closer to the edge of the bluff, you can look down into our development. You'd see our decorative storm, stormwater pond still the, the lake view would be preserved. We have more, I didn't want to get into all the cross sections, but we do have more cross sections with showing actual grades and view corridors from each house above. If, uh, if at the end of the day the board would like to see that, we'd be happy to, to bring those up. Again, one of these, uh, one of the main points that we keep coming back to is this is zoned exactly for what we're proposing and it's been zoned RC forever. So for anybody to, to act surprised that this quarry floor is being developed in an RC use, that should not be. It, it should not be a surprise. <clears throat> Item 13, excessive light. Um, this is always a standard with the RPC at the county level that you must have dark sky compliant downward lighting. We're proposing the same. We don't propose any street lights. We would have lighting only on the homes themselves and low voltage lighting at the, at the uh, motor coach pads, certainly meeting the dark sky compliance. Item 14, major change in the natural character. So, the natural character right now, as, as the before picture showed, is a bare, bare rock. Um, are we matching the natural character? I would say we're improving it by adding the filter of, of soil and, and doing extensive landscaping. So one of the slides I have is uh, <clears throat> the DC, this is the Door County green print goals which kind of identifies areas. As you can see, if you look at the blow up, our quarry site is not included in that. And I think that's because it's, it's basically, basically a um, blank stone surface without the habitat that people deemed worthy of preservation. <coughs> Item 15, financial assurance. So it, it, if, if it's a publicly held project, a lot of times towns or counties would require a financial assurance of a bond or a letter of credit. And typically that protects the town if I'm going to build a town road and I build half of it and I skip town, the town has some recourse to finish that road. In this case, it would not be necessary. This is a completely privately held entity. We're not turning things over to the town. The uh, you know, the worst, worst case scenario on this would be the best case scenario for the neighbors. If this would be reclaimed and soil would be put up there in ponds and the developers would uh, not follow through, this pro the, the quarry floor would be reclaimed, similar to a reclamation plan, at no cost to the town. So, as any, uh, as any project, item 16 talks about potential conditions that might be applied to this project. I put some on a screen. That's totally up to the board. These are just some common ones that, that I've seen in the past as far as approvals. Um, one item we haven't talked about, I guess, is safety. Obviously, there's a 50-foot cliff there that is concerning. 
for people trespassing and using it now. What we, in your packet, you probably saw we had some uh, rock walls planned along that edge to provide that barrier to make sure residents and small dogs, children, do not have an easy path over the cliff. Uh, Michael, touch a little bit on public health and safety. Item 17 <clears throat> uh, uh, states the impact of the proposed project on public health, public safety, or the general welfare of the county. Now, again, with Act 67, um, the uh, subjective uh, concerns of those three items uh, actually become objective uh, facts. So there's a fine line regarding health, safety, welfare to Act 67. Have to be careful understanding the difference between subjective <coughs> statements and objective facts. For example, public health, by definition, is a science of preventing disease. Basically, this is handled by the DNR. Public safety, on the other hand, by definition, is providing public being free of risk or injury. Um, an objective fact here for safety would be, as Pete said, cons uh, construction of some types of wall, fence, barrier to protect people from an unsafe area. A subjective state spa statement would be Bayshore Drive is no longer safe. Uh, once the development is completed. Again, if this can be shown through substantial facts, it's one thing, but a decision should not be made on the subjective uh, statement like that. So again, it's, it's uh, with the revision of Act, or with the uh, Act 67 going into place, these items here are, are kind of on a slippery slope as far as what, what really gets answered or what really becomes the uh, determining factor, whether these items are met. The one thing that is a little more clear would be uh, public welfare, and this is a fairly objective statement, and <coughs> the way we're looking at that would be what is the economic impact to the local community. Um, you don't have it in your packet. It's a report that just came out. Uh, you'll be getting it. But uh, we did hire the National Association of Home Builders to produce a report. Uh, it was titled Local Impact on Quarry Bluff in Wisconsin, uh, and it looks at the income, jobs, taxes generated. We made the assumption that a 75 homes would be built over a, um, over a seven year period, averaging around 11 homes per year. Uh, the report states that $3.1 million in local income will be provided uh, per year for seven years as the 11 homes are built. There'll be over $200,000 worth of taxes and other revenue generated for local governments and state government. Uh, will produce 50 full-time equivalent local jobs, and that again would be over seven years. In addition to that, there's a ripple effect, uh, annual reoccurring impacts for the 11 homes that are built each year. Um, that would generate $236,000 worth of local income, uh, $79,000 worth of tax and other revenue, and five full-time equivalent jobs. And again, that ripple effect means that money that is paid to contractors, other businesses in the area during the development, that money would stay in the local economy, uh, would go back into the economy as employees who are getting paid this money would be buying groceries, gas, clothes, household goods, social entertainment. So again, very big impact to the local economy as well as the county and state if something like this was to happen. So I've... Uh... I have a kind of a closing statement, but let's let's go through any questions that the plan commission may have. We'd be happy to pull up slides again and answer any specific questions and hopefully on your uh, sanitary uh, waste disposal tank, is there any secondary containment for that tank? Uh, no, there isn't. The way they regulate that, obviously, we pressure test the tank when it goes in. The, uh, the pumping reports would be tracked specifically by the county. So usually that's how they catch if there would be some kind of a leak. Um, but yeah, it's a precast concrete tank with six inch walls, reinforced concrete. Um, it's, it's, a, you know, it's the same tanks as everybody has as a private septic tank, except this one's built to a little higher standard, being a 40,000 gallon tank. It's also not on bedrock, I think that's important. Oh, right, yeah, we did some borings down there. We did, we did find a spot where the tank goes that will not be in the blasted bedrock. That's in the, uh, the cobble area down there before the beach starts. 
I have a couple of questions. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I want to go back to the project because I need to understand a little more clearly timing and uh, uh, what, uh, when do you anticipate uh, from the date you get the permit or get the authorization, when do you expect to be, have concluded uh, the, the build out of the project? So the, the, the process here is town, 30 days later, county, probably appealed, board, variance board. That's what we've gone through in the past. Um, obviously, legal challenges can stretch it out. People do that. They did it to a campground I was associated with in Jacksonport. The, you know, if, if we get the green light, you know, we're looking at basically one summer of work to get all the blasting done, all the sewer main done, the water, the, the roads put in. So, you know, I don't know, Mike, if you have a better idea of total build out. Six to eight months of the heavier construction. And um, depending on the market conditions, in terms of the actual build out of, of the units themselves, sell out more, more accurately. Um, anywhere from five to seven years um, is our thinking. And uh, so total, total project time, eight years, nine years, somewhere in that time frame, maybe, maybe 10. Again, you don't know about market conditions, but, uh, but that's the anticipated time frame. Yeah. The, uh, I was curious, you talked about the uh, economic uh, strength of the people who might be interested in acquiring the property, yet I've seen, at least I understand, that you all have indicated or will indicate to potential purchasers the opportunity to put this into the uh, short-term rental pool. Is that right? Yeah, Mike, you can address the experience they had. Uh, historically, uh, yes, a property owner, once they buy in the development, there would be a rental pool that would be offered. Historically, with other developments in the country, about 30% of the people that buy would put their uh, property in a rental pool. Um, but 70%, you know, obviously don't, but historically it's about 30%. Yeah, and, and, and as the, far as regulation, everything on rentals, everything on rentals would have to run through the, the homeowners association and the, man, the management company. Yes. You wouldn't be able to just open the gates and have somebody come in. That would have to go through the rental, the, the person at the front desk to regulate who's coming, who's going. Uh, being a gated community, they're going to have the, the gate arm with the code and, you know, the detectors. If, if it's your car, it'll open for you. If not, you'll need permission to come in type of thing. No, I understand. And I uh, uh, hopefully I can both get through these questions in short order. Um, your, uh, uh, the, um, w when you go out and market this, you're going to have to provide a disclosure statement. Is that right? To uh, purchasers? Uh, that the, that's sure. going to be the you know, is, is disclosing any specific. Uh, well, you're, you're you're selling a condominium, aren't right. you? That's right. Mm -hmm. How will you denominate the ownership interest in the condominium, in the unit? How will you do it? Denominate. Yes. How will it be described uh, uh, in, in in legal terms? Usually, it says, you know, a condominium. It's it's unit A or unit 105. Well, you don't. How are you going to do it in this situation? The people are really purchasing what amounts to a development right. Um, they can develop on their particular parcel, which will be subject to uh, internal rules, regulations, uh, everything down to. I mean, the building design will be very straightforward. There's only only a few designs they can choose from. Um, they can uh, customize their, their landscaping to a degree, again, all within parameters that are set up. But as far as the, uh, uh, again, what they're really purchasing is, 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 a, is a right to a site, but the land is held in common. Okay. Denominated by meets and bounds, or how, how will it be described yes. in the document? Yes. So, so typically, we, we do a lot of condo maps at, at our office. and. You would be purchasing your 60, you'd have your rights to your 60 by 150, mm -hmm. and you would have the right to place one pad for the motor coach and up to a 1,200 square foot footprint, mm -hmm. as long as you meet the 10 yard, 10 foot side yards, things like that on your setback. Okay. So you would, you, would be, you would basically have unit 100 
which would be delineated on a, a condo plat map that would be able to be surveyed if need be to establish your four corners. Okay. Uh, going back to my comment or question about, uh, about putting it in the short-term rental pool, y you think it would be important, wouldn't you, to advise any purchasers of the fact that that may not be available to them? Because this town, at least, has had some very preliminary conversations. And I don't know I don't, that, uh, that short-term rentals need to be looked at and there have been, uh, there's at least one document that has been floated that would simply uh, prohibit short-term rentals. That would be important for you to disclose to your purchasers, wouldn't it? Jim? I, I guess I'm not entirely, short-term okay. rentals in what context? Short-term rentals in what Airbnb and whatever you need. In short-term rentals, uh, Airbnb, VRBO, you know, anything less than, you know, uh, because the town does have the right, if it chooses to, to prohibit short-term rentals of, uh, of six days or fewer. I'm just, I'm just putting you on notice that sure. I think that you ought to, in your marketing uh, materials, if you ever get to that point, you owe it to your purchasers to put them on notice that that may not be involved, that it may not be possible, and so consequently, it could change the economic equation for them. Whatever the code would be, would be placed in the marketing materials or in the or in the. Uh, well, I think you, I think you you need to understand that if a town is seriously considering it, perhaps you want to give the people uh, a heads up. This, this, the, these, re these rentals would pass through uh, the front desk, and they would you know it'd be run, not unlike a, a, a hotel. Uh, well, again, I look at Westwood Shores or, or uh, Bayshore and you know that type of a thing. People come in, they check in the front desk. They no, I understand. I, I don't mean to interrupt yeah. you. I just, oh, I'm just saying that. I guess uh, okay. I'm not, you know, we'd have because, to see how it comes out. And if I could speak to that, Section 16 uh, really lays it out that if people do decide to short-term rent their place, actually they have some restrictions in there that I would mm -hmm. like to see in, in our own about no pets and mock, a maximum number of mm -hmm. occupants and um, safe parking, adequate parking, and things like that. So totally subject to approval of the association, so. I think you're right, but I do think that you ought to be aware of the fact that there, that, that the, the town, at least there is some discussion underway. Uh, it's a very preliminary stage as to whether the town ought to, uh, ought to prohibit short-term rentals altogether. Uh, my question is, is that uh, I understood, and these are, <coughs> See, I was never at the public meeting that you guys held, in part because you excluded people except those people who were on the top of the uh, bluff. Uh, and as far as I know, you've never come to the town so far to have this open discussion about what you got in mind. So I'm going to ask questions that may indicate uh, a certain uh, lack of knowledge, but that's because we've not had this opportunity for a fulsome discussion. That's why we're here. Well, I understand. But I also want you to know that in my ex prior experience, at least, in my prior life, we, uh, I was responsible for acquiring property for building plants and so forth, and we made it, uh, it, was, it was very clear uh, that it was almost axiomatic that we would go to the community and have a fulsome discussion with people on all matters prior to going forward in, on a more formalized uh, basis in order so that everyone knew clearly or understood clearly what was being discussed. So we are at a handicap because all we've got to go on at this point in time is the application. And the application has a lot of holes in it and uh, it's, 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 it's a moving instrument which puts us in a very difficult position to effectively assess the impact of this. Uh, of this. It'll become a more apparent as we go through it this evening. Uh, I understood that you all were going to... Excuse me, Mr. Nellen. Sure. Um, they're having a hard time hearing us in the back of the room, oh, so maybe okay. you could just pull Sorry. your microphone in a tad. <laughs> And I don't, mean the, I, I, I don't mean to dominate the conversation. So, but um, I understood that, uh, you've, as you've indicated, uh, in connection with your stormwater uh, control system, the importance of soil. You said soil is the ultimate filter. Uh, I was under the impression that you all were going to put in a three-foot layer of soil on top of bedrock, and that that would be done uh, uh, from the get-go uh, now I understand from reading some materials from the Department of Natural Resources that you have informed the Nat Department of Natural Re Resources that you don't intend to do that. In fact, 
when you put down that three foot uh, layer of soil, and if I'm wrong, I'd, I'd, I'd surely appreciate being corrected, but that it, when that is put down, that's going to be a cost to the purchaser of the unit. Is that right? I, I can address that. So the way the, way the DNR regulations are, are currently written, and the way the DNR is treating all of our projects up here with shallow soil. So if, if you want to soak away what they consider dirty water through a stormwater pond, an infiltration pond, for dirty water they'd consider five feet of separation mandatory, three feet if they consider it cleaner water, but with the liner of the storm pond, that eliminates the need for the three feet because now you have a permeable, uh, pr um, impermeable layer that is, that is capturing the stormwater. I appreciate that. That's not answering my question, though. Although I understand liners full well because I worked for a paper company for 20 years and we were very comfortable, understood the issue of liners. Sure. And, they're, and unfortunately, all too often, they're failure, uh, which surprises everyone. Uh, I'm talking about something else, and that is your own document, your application says that you will lay down a significant layer of soil uh, as part of your stormwater treatment plan. It goes beyond just the, the, the ponds, it says. And I understood, based on what had been, uh, what, what I had heard earlier, simply by rumor, that you were going to, as part of your infrastructure, that you were going to undertake initially, you were going to do that. And now I understand, based no, on what the DNR... We are going to, in the beginning, right in the first stages of putting the infrastructure in, after the roads are in, the sewer, things like that, we will be taking soils and putting them throughout the entire site during that first phase, okay? That happens right, right away within the first, you know, couple months. How much soil are you going to lay down? It all depends on the grade that we need right. to get I, the water to go places. I, 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 to I would not say we ever said we're going to put down three feet of soil throughout the project. Yeah, that, I, that, that, would not, that would not be consistent with anything I've ever seen from a stormwater perspective. You know, we're talking about the escarpment in the Door County where you've got Horseshoe Bay Golf Course on six inches of soil to, uh, to change the standard to someone parking a motor coach and, and putting in a single family home on three feet of material. Um, you know, again, the, the focus of getting the dirty water to the storm pond is the whole premise behind the, the curb and gutter. I understand, but it also affects the aesthetics of it also because you point, you constantly point everyone in the direction of Petoskey and you say, that's our example. Problem is, and there are trees everywhere, You're, you can't replicate that because you aren't going to have the soil depth to support all of that, uh, uh, that vegetation, those trees, are you? Well, you know, we, we would certainly landscape it similar to what the, the slides of Petoskey, that's the goal. Um, do we need a three feet of soil? But you can't replicate, I don't mean to interrupt. Right. right. I don't know why we wouldn't. Yeah, I think okay. uh, I don't know why we wouldn't be able to. We have, if you need it, if you're into transplanting a larger tree, you, you burn it up and you, you create more soil. I, I, I'll use an example of North Haven. That whole thing is on a foot of soil in a lot of it, not the whole thing, but most of it. And we put trees in that were 30 feet high. But again, we had to create berms. We had to stake them down for the first five years. That kind of thing happens. But you do, you know, you do it. You make it happen. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to defer to someone else for a moment. I've got some other questions. On these uh, house for these lots, do they have to build a house, or is that their option? It's their option. It's their option. They do not have to build a house. If they do not want to. Okay, so many of them may not may choose to not have a house. Historically, on other projects, about seventy percent would build a house. So, um, so we're looking at somewhere around seventy-five to eighty houses at full build out, even though it allows one hundred and fifteen. And they have a, you have a predetermined uh, floor plans or styles of houses that yes. that's all they can choose from? Yes, yes. We had to turn those into the county. They want to see f uh, footprint size and a floor uh, number of bedrooms. They want to know that. That's part of the approval. So, um, so, so it, is, it is in the packet. Well, I've seen the, what they look like. I yeah. didn't know if that was required or not. Yeah, that's going to be just those. Yeah. Are there basements? No. Crawl space? 
Sometimes, maybe, depending on the situation. So will there be more blasting, more no, for no, that would only a house? No, a build-up event. Otherwise, it would be a slab, depending on the situation. Would a person have the opportunity to go to any builder of their choice to build that? No. no. There will be a few builders that we work with that have the choice of, of contractors, have the choice of subs within, a, 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 again, a well-defined group. We, you need to control those kinds of things. Just as you would a condominium development, Same. a multiple sure. occupancy development is right. a condominium development. You own the lot, but you need to comply with these right. restrictions and style and architecture. So they don't okay. own a percentage of the common area? Well, yeah, they do, actually. Um, you own yeah. one one hundred and seventeenth of, 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 all the, the, of the common area. Okay. Yeah. It would be considered undivided interest in any mm -hmm. of the common area. Correct. All right, Mr. Zettel, you've been very patient. Yeah, I was wondering if they were doing this in alphabetical order. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, been, I've been used to that since grade school. So uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, I got a lot of questions, but let's. I think the, the, the big one I have is on sanitary. If I look at the sanitary plan, um, it makes us, where I need some help is reconciling the number of rooms, because in the the sample diagram you show, you show the sewer and water lateral going into the house, but I didn't see a connection to the RV. I'm assuming those RVs, if they're there with the house, they will be connected? Yes. Okay, so the, so the question I have is, in the sanitarium's report, how do they reconcile number of rooms? Because I think there's a lot of concern, especially when you look at the rental market, you know, in your uh, uh, association kind of draft you have, you know, if you're two bedrooms, you can only have um, maximum, I think, of uh, six people. If you had three, you can have, so that kind of just says, like what happens in a lot of rental markets, that couch turns into a height of bed you know, uh, typically. And then on top of that, you have the RV, it's, you have the RV itself. And so when they're making assumptions, what's the breakup between what's in the house versus how many bedrooms, because I know a lot of the sanitary kinds of analyses are based on bedrooms, not number of people. And I think it's recognizing what's the most conservative approach from a sanitary protection uh, to look at number of bedrooms, you know, with the house plus the RV. So that's one question. And then I th and making sure that flows through in the calculations. And then I think the other one is um, in the sanitarian's analyses, they had an assumption of roughly 12,000 uh, gallons per day, you know, relative to their flow. But when you look at the water analysis for the well, it's, it's over 20,000 gallons per day. So when you, when you flow, no, pardon the pun, when you flow all that through back to the sanitarian, that net net is, that says it's 20 gallons per day, 20,000 gallons per day, not 12, which means if you use your 3X estimate for the size of the tank, that tank gets a lot bigger than, than what is planned. Can you reconcile the water versus the, the sanitary estimates sure. there just to make sure that, that those tie? Sure, so, so the, there's two different players here. One would be DNR water. Um, we're estimating the, I believe I said, 85 gallons per day, per minute, per well, would be your peak demand. And that's based on number of residents, I believe. The sanitary code is specifically written, written on bedrooms or employees, depending on what kind of use you have. Um, in this case, we use two and a half bedrooms as an average, as far as per site, a two and a half bedroom allotment, which would basically mean if, if it's just a couple and they have their motor coach, it's gonna act as if two people, not a two and a half, you know, two and a half bedroom is, is, is I guess, the average of what we're looking at. Uh, we've got, um, I do a lot of large scale wastewater systems throughout the state. So what the state does as far as their approval is they can, you can either use straight code flows, you can use metered data, you can use historic data, you can use all of that. So what we've done over the last two years is there's a lot of data based on a, th a thousand or more um, develop, residential developments based on number of bedrooms. We computed it. It came up to 41 gallons per bedroom per day for 10 different subdivisions, let's say. So based on that data, the state would honor that and say, sure, that's a realistic amount. In my opinion, this project would use less water than our standard residential development based on very limited children 
being living here full time, it's more of a tourist destination. We anticipate the owners of the motor coach would be there, possibly have guests occasionally, but predominantly it would be two people per site. We're doing two and a half bedrooms, which we feel is conservative, which puts you up about um, around 100 gallons per day per lot. So the, there's a difference between this system and some of the larger on-site systems I've designed. So in a, a, a large on-site system, I've designed, I've got a list here if you'd like to see them, but I've designed systems up to 100,000 gallons per day that gets disposed of on a, on a site. So what, what the concern is in an on-site system is the drain field. So if you overload a drain field, what would happen would be maybe the drain field would fail and you'd have a failing system and you would then have effluent ponding or whatever. So in this case, that's certainly not a concern. Even if we're wrong on our estimate, you simply show up with the truck and you pump and haul at the town. Um, what the town, what the, the only th restriction we have as far as our permit for the holding tank is to make sure that it's going to Sturgeon Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant and that they have capacity. So Sturgeon Bay Treatment Plant has 2.5 million gallons a day capacity. They're currently operating at 60% of that. So they have tons of capacity in Sturgeon Bay, uh, excepting holding tank wastewater certainly doesn't, uh, isn't a, an impact. But so I guess what it comes down to is we're estimating that peak flow, peak based on our estimates, that you may have two tanker trucks a day pumping and hauling. Okay. And, and relative to the pumping and hauling, I know you've talked about the considerations to, um, you know, reduce, uh, reduce odor. Um, one of the things, too, is relative to pumping, is that basically, you know, once they're alerted it, that the truck has to come out, or, or is there provisions that can be made relative to off-period time uh, right. pumping so it's, so it's less of a disruption for road traffic and... And, uh, and uh, neighboring residences. Is right. that something I, that Yeah, I had a conversation with uh, Tony Gasser. He runs septic maintenance. They have large pumping trucks, and he would be the guy involved. Um, what they do for uh, Westwood Shores, things like that, is they make sure Thursday afternoon, Friday morning, that thing's empty. Then they usually leave it alone over the weekend, come back Monday, and they know, you know, if it's a normal weekend, they're good, and they, they start again Monday. So. We, we would have a contract with a large hauler. He would have it on his schedule. We would know in a hurry if, hey, last weekend there was 5,000 gallons a day. The weekend before there was, last year it was, that it would be, tried to be empty before weekends if we see those weekend peaks. Got it. Okay. I'll ask one more and then I'll, I'll yield to someone else on, in the commission. Um, uh, safe vehic vehicular and pedestrian access and I think traffic kind of, kind of rolls into that as well. Um, in the original proposal, there is really no consideration for pedestrians or plans for pedestrians relative to walkways, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, based on the feedback, you know, from the public, I think, I think it is a, a valid concern relative to Penny Park, relative to um, resident or uh, vacationers that want to access the park, whether it's for boating, whether it's to, uh, to, to walk down there and, and enjoy the park. Um, and, you know, is, since that's kind of considered a pinch point, when you think of there's 88 parking spaces at Penny Park for, um, for, for boat access, uh, raw, uh, storage, parking, right? Those are, you know, 22-foot Ford super cabs with, you know, 26-foot boat plus tongue length. Some of those are large rigs, very similar to a class A right when it's pulling the car. So you got all that traffic activity at that pinch point, this, you know, especially in the busy summer months. And that traffic study was done, I think, in the June time frame, basically just kind of north of Alabama Street. So when you look at that, um, that sample that was done, uh, that, that was referenced in the traffic study, but not really having the benefit of what is it like with all that, say, the boat traffic, especially in the summer months, and the pedestrians uh, in that space, um, you know, considering, you know, what that might be either from a from a study perspective or, or impact relative to, um, you know, the safety of both your your customers as well as you know people that are along the drive. So I think the pedestrian areas is a point of concern. Now, the other one is from a traffic. Um, I did an, an I was surprised by the analysis that said 70% of the traffic would go south. 
And, you know, with all due respect to the residents of Sturgeon Bay, as uh, someone, um, you know, I, I grew up in Sturgeon Bay, uh, but, you know, as my friends when I worked in the Milwaukee area would say, oh, do you live in Sturgeon Bay? Well, or are you moving to Sturgeon Bay? Well, if you're going to move to Sturgeon Bay, why don't you just move to Door County? So, <laughs> we, we know a lot of people go north, so one of the uh, things I did with uh, the help of the, of the Door County Tourism is I plotted all the uh, ADR, average daily rate of rooms filled in Door County for 2018 uh, for all the towns that they you know, collect room taxes on. And almost two and a half times that is north of Sevastopol, you know, the, the rest is south. So, you know, and I use that as a proxy, you know, from some objective data, sorry, you know, where do people tend to go when they're in the county? And it's north. And so the question is, um, from a traffic study perspective, is that relevant relative to how you look at traffic patterns and if people are coming home at the end of the day and they're heading south, do they need a, a more dedicated turn lane to, to turn in or just look at that, those traffic patterns there because people might be coming more southbound at the end of the day or during the day more so than northbound. And so I, I'm just from a traffic pattern, you know, I was surprised that the assumption was, oh, they'll go to a large urban center which is Sturgeon Bay, but just looking at vacation, vacationers in Door County, and this is a vacation crowd. I mean, retirees have a lot of money to spend. Um, you know, they may, be, they may be going north, except in the fall when they're heading to Packer games. So, um. <laughs> in working with a traffic engineer, the, his, his um, how he arrived at it, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, but uh, the 70% thought was that uh, people would run into town uh, for, for groceries, Walmart, pharmacy, uh, those kinds of restaurants, you know, those kinds of things, lunch, whatever. Yeah. A little more often than they would take a venture to the north that's sort of an all-day affair right. kind of a thing. That's how that was arrived okay. at. When it comes to the, the boots on the ground issues of, of turn, turn lanes and things like that, I believe we already have a uh, deceleration lane going northbound to take a right into the complex. If we need or if a condition is placed or whatever on us to make a, a, a go around lane for those, you know, so, so traffic southbound could go around somebody taking a left, that's something we can do. You know, that's, that's okay. a, yeah. within the... Sure. I think from the feedback, thank, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. I, one of the, the pieces of feedback, you know, relative to the assumption that the traffic study uh, articulated, you know, was the fact that they looked at this as kind of more of a uh, residential type complex with houses and that sort of thing. And I think the, the feedback was since you have RVs, since you might be doing more short term, it's more, more recreational in nature right, versus, you know, go to town, go to the drugstore, sure. go to the groceries, and so there may be much more traffic as that traffic factor that they, they had in the standards that they referenced. So just okay. a, a point there. So I'll, I'll yield for any other questions that some folks might have. Thank you. Ms. Ramstack. Um, kind of piggybacking on you, because I had the somewhat along the same lines, is on your site plan, I saw no dump stations. Now the Class A motorhomes carry, or motor coaches, excuse me, carry whatever. Uh, 35, 40 gallon, maybe more of black water, gray water, fresh water. It led me to, in reading about the, the plan on the um, uh, sanitary waste disposal, in your estimate of the gallonage, that was based on the houses. You've also got 117 RVs with many gallons of, as I say, black water, gray water, uh, needing fresh water that will need to be dumped. I saw nothing on the, the site, on the site plan at all, of dump stations. Right. So, so each motor coach would have their own sewer hookup. So they would simply hook it up into, and it would drain into our gravity sewer down to the holding Our tank. Lot. Each, lot. Each lot, when you pull in, you hook up to our sewer, and if you happen to have some waste in your tank from traveling there, it, it could just connect into the, your own personal sewer at your, at your site. Okay, so both the black water and the gray yes. water would... Yes. Well, what about fresh water? 
there'll be a, there'll be a hookup. There'll be a freshwater hookup at each site. Do you anticipate, uh, say, a 50 amp or whatever uh, electrical yeah. yes. outlet? Yes. So it would be like the Petoskey, where you right. see I, them on the side exactly. like a little. Yeah, we see no reason for people to ever turn on their generators while they're there. They're hooking up. Okay. Similar to a marina, the same pedestals are used. Okay, I didn't see that on the site plan, so I, I, it made me wonder. Mm -hmm. um, also, on the site plan, which I don't know, uh, this is dealing with emergency services, and you have the one driveway that's dedicated for emergency in the main. You actually, in my opinion, looking at it, you actually still have one in ingress and one egress. Because the emergency lane on the site plan merges into the main plan. So, you have an evacuation or of some sort or other. And, I, you know, it's a massive thing. I'm going down any lane I got to get out of that place, in my opinion. Well, meanwhile, you have emergency personnel trying to feed in. It, it, it just seemed to me to be a, a congestive boondoggle. Sure. Um, can and you address yeah, that? Sure. A, a lot of communities, they actually have, for residential communities, they have a, a cul-de-sac length maximum that's permissible. And that's basically the reason. You don't want to be 3,000 feet off the main road and something blocks the road and your house is on fire. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, you know, we do have the two access points. The road's going to be 20 feet wide, just like Bayshore Drive. You could certainly get by if somebody's car is stalled and you have to get up um, to plan anything more than that for a catastrophe you know we we have the big loop around we have the i, I guess yeah, we, we could look the at road. it i know right. the loop around the property i'm talking, talking about, about the, the entrance road, road. Yeah. it appears to me a disaster in well, the making but that's you know my opinion width. looking at it right and that and that yeah it comes down to the width i guess um i guess i struggle with that being any different than bayshore drive if your house is north of sturgeon bay and it's on fire and there's an accident on Bayshore Drive blocking the road. Yeah, but there you pretty much have flat land to go over if you had to. Sure. This you got. No, I, I see. We can, and we can certainly, I mean, it, we can review just, that. It sure. confused me a little bit. I just couldn't see I, the practicality of that. Tim uh, Deitman and I did discuss that. Uh, we discussed that, that and the, they came up with a determination that the the area that's um, where the two come together and it basically forms one going up in, mm -hmm. we will keep that wide enough that in, in a real emergency, a fire truck can push a car out of the way without okay. any trouble. But it'll be you know kept wide enough so that in either event, it, highly unlikely that that's so. Right, but I mean, you got to do a worst case scenario. You've got 170 people you know? trapped on top of a. Well, is it the same width as a, as our town roads? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. or wider. So. Okay. I had one other. Oh, one. oh I would just and while I'm just on a roll here, um, <laughs> the potable water system. Um, I know you were going to have a little building and so on and so forth, and then it made it. There was a comment about floor drain discharge and the little box marked to the ground was marked. Is this relevant? Uh, I don't think it's relevant. The, what, what that's for is if you flush a line or do a sample in there and something spills on the floor, they want to have a, a floor drain in your well house. Right, so the out. water would go down the right. drain and not into a hole. Yeah, tank you typically put a varmint, a varmint proof netting on the outside. Um, We've seen it both ways. Some people hook it right into the sanitary because it's never used, and some people right. discharge it to the I ground. I was just curious. I saw it marked on one of the application forms that you needed to submit, mm -hmm. and I had, hmm, okay, just wondered about that. Um, and then th I think this came up earlier, and I just, but I wanted to verify it. The, the gas at the project is natural gas. The natural gas does go out that far, right. so it will not be propane. Correct. And in on the site plans for the homes, they show fireplaces. What appears to be a fireplace, there was no little wording on it, just showed. Are those all gas? Those are the gas, yeah. Okay, so no, the no wood burning no is... Wood burning. 
Right. The only one might he, be the one at that main mm -hmm. comp. Yeah. Right. Main and building. even, yeah, the outdoor fire pits by right. each one would be natural gas. Right. I, I just, I really didn't remember if natural gas went out that far. It goes right to the south edge of the property at this point. Oh, okay. So you're going to bring it in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it for me right now. I wanted to return very quickly to the uh, uh, to the traffic study that Robert E. Lee uh, undertook, and I, I saw a couple of uh, things that uh, I was that caught my attention. One of which is is the annual average daily traffic is over the course of a year. I assume, so we can assume. Can I not assume that you've understated the traffic? Uh, during the summer and probably overstated the traffic during the winter months because you've taken an average, an annual average. I mean, that's what it says. That is the normal traffic count is called the annual average daily traffic. That would have been the, the way that it was expressed in the DOT. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, Robert E. Lee would have put a tourism impact factor on there. I guess they would have, but I haven't studied it that closely. Okay. Well, they had that. I mean, they took snapshots, you know, the end of June and I think in the fall. Um, we can assume July and August will be higher. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's how I think a reasonable person would interpret it. Yeah. So, secondly, what caught my attention, which I've almost never seen in a, uh, in a, uh, a study by a, uh, an engineer, it says, however, even though the, uh, I'm, I'm, my own words, even though the historical growth is 3.3 percent. It says, however, to be conservative, it is assumed that the traffic growth will be half of the recent growth, say 1.65 percent. I've never seen a professional engineer talk in those terms. I mean, what is there, what possible basis would there be to, uh, to once having determined what the historical growth in traffic is, to say, well, in order to be conservative, which benefits the applicant, you, we're just going to cut that in half. Can you explain that to me? No idea. Can you see it on there? No. No, but it's the same, it's the same issue on the traffic report where they round up to 330 mm -hmm. when they're comparing it to the development in Michigan. They round it up and they say this is conservative. Um, even though there's more, they're saying uh, the one in Michigan, there was 135 units occupied. Their, their peak daily traffic was 213. Therefore, the projected 330 trips for the Cory Bluff seems conservative. And it's 100 times higher. Well, with, so <laughs> I understand, but that goes back to the comment uh, that uh, my colleague made, which is, are you using the right analysis? Have you identified the right group of people to determine their, how frequently their, their vehicle usage would be? And if, you're going, if your base analysis is wrong by 50%, then that travels all the way through the document and makes the end result suspect. Sure, I guess, you know, I guess looking at big picture here, capacity of Highway B right now is 12,000 to 15,000 vehicles per day. It's currently at 1,700, so just under 2,000. So if we're, if we're squabbling about is it 200, 300, 400, you know, if you're at 12 to 15,000 capacity and you're at 2,000 vehicles per day, that, that highway has 10,000 vehicles per day extra capacity. Certainly, you know, I think we're a drop in the bucket compared to 12 to 15,000, yeah. regardless of how you interpret if it's 200 or say 500. Now think of what you've just said, Pete, okay? Because yep. they say the capacity, Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin DOT considers the capacity of a two-lane rural high, a roadway to be 12,000 to 15,000 vehicles per day. And it says, for reference, uh, uh, Highway uh, 42 has an annual average uh, daily uh, traffic of 5,600 vehicles per day. Well, we know, we know that in the summer, not in the winter, but in the summer, you can sometimes not even be able to get on Highway 42. Right. So my point is that there has been, that this document, this, this study, I'm just putting it on, on notice, is valueless. It is, it's incumbent. Yeah. And I, I think I'm going off memory, but I know looking at traffic counts for other developers and where's where's a good spot to buy commercial property and 
I think we have about 13,000 coming over the big bridge in summer, over the big, the big highway bridge. Okay. So, you know, to put that in comparison, they'd say, okay, this road is capable of handling that. I agree, maybe that's a stretch. But, but again, we're, we're at 2,000 cars per day. There's two th And right we know now, during the summer, those of us who live on, off the Bayshore, how, how, much, how well traffic that is. Right. I, the only reason is, is, you know, you had mentioned before about the fact that the uh, RPC, when it makes this determination, is required to base it on substantial evidence, okay? Well, the document also says that an applicant, that's you, Failure to demonstrate by substantial evidence that the application and all applicable requirements and conditions established by the county, such as these 17 criteria, uh, 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 if, if you, you fail to demonstrate uh, that the, uh, there's been by substantial evidence that the application of all applicable requirements uh, uh, will be satisfied, the conditional use permit should be decided, uh, denied. Here, here yeah. just so you understand where I'm coming from, we only have the permit that you submitted, application you submitted to uh, the uh, Land Use Services Department. We don't have the benefit of anything else. And we have to value, evaluate your, your application on the basis of the information contained in the application that was submitted to us, which is why and there was an awful lot in that application that was to count. You know, this study is in the process of being performed, this study. You all have been in discussions with uh, the Dreitzers and with, the, uh, with the, uh, the county for over 18 months. You had plenty of time to give us a completed application that details all the information that doesn't talk about stuff on the go, doesn't say, well, we'll give you this, or we'll give you that, or we'll put together our wastewater treatment pl uh, plan and provide it to you. We, just bear in mind so you understand where I'm coming from, because it's a matter of fundamental fairness. It's due process. We can't effectively assess the impact of this application if you don't give us something that's complete in all respects. And if you don't give us something that's complete in all respects, we have no alternative but determine that you have not complied with your responsibility to provide us substantial evidence. So that's the, that's the problem. You have put us in a terrible bind. Well, that sure wasn't the intention. No, the certainly the not. The, uh, it we, this is a big, big deal. This is a, by your own admission, this is a huge, huge project. This isn't some request for a CUP because a guy wants to put up a pole barn next to his neighbor. This has to do, there could be as many as four or 500 people up there during the busy summer months. We're talking about an impact on, on, bra, uh, on, on, on Bayshore Drive, which those of us who live on it know we don't need a traffic analysis tell us that there are times during the summer when it's when the traffic is going up and down and people are strolling you know are strolling and walkers and bicyclists I'm just saying recognize that you have put us in a situation where at least by my by my uh, uh, standards doesn't leave me and I haven't heard from the other side but just looking at the application that's been presented and its failure to provide the information necessary for us to make a decision, you have put us in a terrible bind. We feel that the study we brought in was fine. <coughs> you pointed out things that you disagree with. We can get clarification from the engineer who performed the study if you want to question that person. But, you know, when it comes to this entire, let's, let's take traffic as an example. Frankly, like Pete pointed out, we are nowhere near the capacity of that road. And if there's any safety issues there at all, it's because people are parking their trailers and their contractor trailers and everybody has to go around them. That is creating, that should be eliminated. I mean, that's creating a much, far more than if we added twice as many people. And doesn't that, stuff. by definition, take you, make it an exception to the DOT's analysis of what a normal rural highway should, uh, what its capacity is. 
it's 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 you you can't you can't have both sides of that argument. If you read this, you would say that that according to the w, uh, Wisconsin DOT, uh, Bayshore Drive should be able to absorb five times the traffic it currently experiences based on your analysis. Well, we all know that's farcical. That can't happen. So you know yeah, it is. We. And that, I can't. You're right, that. okay. and that's why we should discard much of what's in here. Well, I don't know about that, but again, those are well, I, I understand, but understand it from our perspective, or at least from my perspective. Anyway, I. Well, we'll get clarification. Right. Yeah, well, we have to get clarification of that. Right. I think prior to the RPC meeting, we certainly find more traffic data of current rates, and we have the report either the guy here to explain that to the RPC or this board again if we come back and uh, get comfortable with the number. The problem is, is that at the end of the day, if there's a dispute, you are denying people who have a legitimate concern about the veracity of the materials you put in your document. You are denying them the opportunity of securing their own experts and having a discussion so that they can present a case. You've denied them that because you didn't provide an application that was complete. Okay, well, I, I don't want to argue with you, um, but when, when we submit a 500-page application and the guy at the county says, you've nailed everything, it is now appropriate to send it to the town, and they hired a consultant to do a traffic analysis, I feel they did their due diligence. Now, if the traffic analysis is flawed, that's certainly appropriate to revisit it. Um, if the traffic analysis is completely wrong, let's find a different company to do it. I, I, I guess I don't know how to answer the thing, but to say that our, our submittal is not complete or flawed, I would object to that. We, we spent 18 months putting it together. Which is why you should have gotten all of this stuff worked out ahead of time rather than giving us a half-finished work product it is that not we have to get. Okay. It is not even. I, th okay. I think we've argued the point enough. You've made your point, Mr. Nellen, and you've responded accordingly. We'll come to that when we have our discussion at the end. And, and it plays through the entire time. You're right. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hubner, did you have another I just question? had a couple, couple other. Sure. Move. Go ahead. Just a couple little quick. Uh, the uh, septic tanker trailer, uh, tractor trailer, what's the gross weight of that full? 80,000. 80, and what's the, and the road capacity is built for 80,000? So you're at the limit. Actually, well, Mike, you you worked with John Kologi. Uh, it's built. We can go through the, the how many inches of blacktop and how many inches of subbase and all that sort of a thing. But it's built to handle full-on semi-traffic and, and you know, whatever whatever people throw at it. Legally, legally licensed vehicles, eighty thousand pounds is the is what the road is designed to handle. So. So it's, it's, as long as it's not over 80,000 pounds, it meets. And nothing should be going down eight, over 80,000 unless they got some kind of special permit or something. There's some, there's some factors depending on the, uh, the distance between axles that would allow you to handle more weight and not, not uh, and distri distribute that weight over a longer portion of that truck. So yes, you can go higher than 80,000 pounds in total. But that specific axle, or whatever that combination of axles in that specific area, cannot be over eighty thousand pounds. So, and I don't know what these trucks are. These trucks are eighty thousand pounds. When it's yeah. What's the? I, I what's the? To, by the way, in a previous life, I used to uh, own oil flush, and uh, I sold that in '93. But I'm intimately familiar with the trucks and the equipment and everything that's used. What's the uh, capacity of the tank on those trailers? Well, the tanks themselves are typically. Um, like 9,000? 8,500 is typical. But you can't, that, that's but you can only haul what? 7,000 7, yeah. or something? 7. Mm -hmm. That's what puts you, you know, close Legally. to a little under 80. So Royal Flush never today. went over the limit either. I'll tell you what, not, not with Super Trooper around. <laughs> <laughs> or Leo for that matter. Mm -hmm. the, the other quick question was on the, um, uh, the ponds that, uh, what, what is the life expectancy of that 60 mil liner? Right, so, so the HDPE product, the, uh, 
one of the old things that would go wrong with ponds would be if you'd have sun de degradation, if the liner would be exposed to the, the sun. So that 60 mil, again, that's the same as a landfill. I, I don't have that exact number, but I think it's lifetime 40, I don't know. I, we would have to look into exactly what it's warranted for. I'm not sure. Let's say 40 years down the road, uh, the life expectancy is up on that. How is that going to be paid for to put a new liner in? Yeah, so, so it'll be just like any condo development. You would have dues, annual fees, and that would be an account that would have to handle maintenance and road maintenance, things of that nature. Right over the top. Mm -hmm. yeah, just lay a new one down. Yeah. Okay, no. Mr. Zettel? Yeah, I have just three questions, um, just in the interest of time, just to cover real quick. One is on the... Um, the, the question about natural character. And in, in the RPC, they talk about, um, you know, you, since it is a commercial property, you need to put in a vegetarian, uh, vegetarian, vegetation <laughs> barrier, excuse me, um, that, is along the, that uh, is along the perimeter. And then their draft proposal that we saw said it's basically had to go around the entire property. And, and so it would be good to see, to see if, from a rendering perspective, what that looks like from the front, especially when you're looking at adding a barrier. Because um, I think, um, you know, commercially, I think you're trying to sell sight lines. And if you've got trees that can, that can be no less than 10 feet apart, that are evergreens, that are going to grow, you know, five, you know, seven to 10 feet in diameter, um, you know, does that, is that going to be an issue relative to sight lines and the desirability of the lots? That's, that's one question. Um, and I know there's also been some discussions about, you know, cutting back trees to not hurt the sight lines and would that, uh, for the people about the bluff and what that would do to, you know, to, to, that, um, to that promise. And then the second question is that the spirit of the law of, the, of that vegetation barrier is to hide the commercial development from from the roads and from adjacent, adjacent property. And so the million dollar question for me from a visual perspective is, how do you effectively do that for the people that live on top of the bluff? Because right. you, know, you can't plant an evergreen on their, on, on their property lines. Um, and if you look at a lot of you know, uh, residential properties where you know you got people that live down the valley, they got tr you know, uh, canopy trees, deciduous trees, you know, that, that kind of blend in and, and cover that, and I see a lot of you know evergreens and and small plants. So I'm just looking from a visual sure. perspective. How does that kind of blend in with the rest of the um, you know the the trees, the hemlocks, the, right. the birch, the maples that we see along Bayshore Drive? Okay, um, Renee, if you I don't know if you'll be able to grab it, but I think somewhere we have all the landscaping shown on one of those plans while I talk. So right or wrong, the county's ordinance isn't well fit for this site because we have a 50 foot wall behind us, but they're still requiring us to do the landscape buffer and plant those trees down below. So I don't know if there's a way around that. We had the discussion with the county how it's somewhat ridiculous and is there other things we could be doing? And the answer was follow the ordinance or else you're not following the ordinance. So I think we're kind of stuck following the, the, the county's ordinance and whatever it requires is what we have to do. Um, I don't know if at the base we'll see if Renee can bring up. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I, we had I, a site plan, Renee, that just had all the yeah. little symbols on it. Yeah, there's the letter of the law relative to what the regulation right. says, and I think the question is, what is the, the spirit of it relative to both, you know, making sure that you don't see, you know, very importantly, you don't see the RVs from the roadway, and you and you minimize that from an eyesore perspective for residents that live on top, as well as. The uh, visual, you know, visual harmony—not just the um, the dwellings themselves, but the visual harmony for what you're used to seeing for vegetation uh, along Bayshore Drive. I think that's where right. it, and so it'd be I good think, to see some depictions of what that would be yeah, like in a city think, state. Uh, this would be the landscape buffer that's required by the county. That dark line. So, you know, again, we're kind of stuck doing what the code prescribes. I don't know. Um, I don't know how to handle that, I guess. Okay. You, you had asked about along the bluff if we put uh, uh, evergreen trees. You know, they would be topped at the appropriate level so that people can see it doesn't affect it from on top. And also, 
our people in the back with some of the taller buildings, we're hoping we'll be able to get a glimpse of the water. Once the trees are in place, those people who have lots that the trees are actually on, will be, the trees will be selectively trimmed, no different than the water right now. A lot of people have places on the water. I believe you're bound to a 30%, you can only trim 30% of the vegetation between your house and the water. So what do you do? You, you select the views from the windows, you take out as much little dead stuff as you can, and you, and you work with it. And, and it really, that's about as close as we can come to answering that. Regarding the back wall, yeah, as we just discussed, it's kind of silly, frankly, to put these trees down along that back wall because they don't protect anybody from anything. It is the code. We would prefer actually to work with the people on top and take some of those trees and put them up if they want us to so that they could possibly screen our buildings if that's what they would want and then still be able to see out to the lake and the bay and everything else beyond. That's how we would prefer to do it. But again, you know, we'll do whatever the code is and, and that's just the way it yeah, is. Yeah, I, I think it's from a visual harmony perspective, can you do that with canopy trees or, or something else? Like Again, in, in consultation with, uh, with uh, the property owners up above. Right. Um, so I, I think that's probably something that probably has more discussion maybe with the RPC as well. Um, the, the second question has to do with uh, financial um, uh, consideration. Uh, and I, and I, I think uh, my colleague over here kind of started rel relative to the project start, what's going to get done, what's going to get completed. And just from a historical perspective, just you know, because of I, I, got to, I got to experience it, there was a developer uh, named John Madunza uh, who did a development called the Moorings out in Idlewild. And you guys are kind of chuckling about that, right? That the, 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 there was a planned development with condos or other living quarters, and then they also built a uh, a uh, pub bar called the Moorings and ran out of money and the only thing that existed was the Moorings but to get to the Moorings you would drive down a lot and you would see you know some walls with just you know concrete you know uh, concrete foundation and rebar hanging out I mean it looked like it was it was bombed at one point but it was just they just ran out of funds and I think that's where it goes into the financial consideration saying you know yeah you do all the infrastructure but but then what? Then does a clubhouse get built and you have a commitment to build that clubhouse and, and run it? Um, and, and I think that's, you know, relative from a financial assurance. What's the minimum that you need to have available so that you have a going concern that's doing the maintenance, you know, uh, doing the building upkeep, getting all the vegetation, uh, planting done, not by the homeowners so it doesn't look like pockmarked, but, you know, some of the minimal stuff that's needed so that it doesn't create any other visual distractions? Again, in the very beginning, the infrastructure all goes in. The soil is, is placed and, and graded out. It, it, and that all happens before our first sale. A lot of the developments you're talking about are things that, that tend to be partially built and, and then they, you know, the, the bottom falls out. It's a situation where they are sales driven throughout their, their, their the structuring, you know, the building of the building, this type of a thing. Having been through some, some bumpy times, that's what some of the appeal is when you, when you do the you know, single family individual units, because if things slow down, you simply stop and you have a green field where nothing has been built yet, compared to the stone that's there now. Everything we do happens in terms of the infrastructure and, and, and again, greening up, we'll call it, the site before our first sales book, so it's not sales dependent. That's the difference. Okay. And I think that's what would be helpful in the application to kind of show here's the vegetation, here's the build out, here's what's laid in place from, you know, the landscaping, the, the barriers from a safety perspective, you know, are the pickleball courts going to be built? Are the, you know, is the clubhouse going to be in place? You know, what's kind of that infrastructure there before you were, you know, before that sales? Because I think that's from a financial assurance you know, what would the town be left holding the bag, right? If if, if something, what yeah, I know I understand what you're saying, but I, but I think that's understanding from that timeline, that evolution of okay. through fruition. Yeah, it would be helpful to clarify that. Uh, the the last one, um, my colleague here touched on a little bit, and it's the e the economic impact. And I think um, I think the general welfare is something that's part here is really 
not is really understated. And I think um, you you mentioned the report that just got done. It, it'd be great to get a handle on it to analyze that. State of Wisconsin, and you and you had kind of the Door County snapshot that shows the direct, indirect, and induced economic impact of tourism in the state. And I think uh, you know knowing that that the, your demographic you know, has more spending capacity than millennials and Gen Xers, whatever. I think that in an economic model, looking at the length of stay, because I think it's also not clear, you know, the people that come and park their RVs, because that flows into the traffic studies, and how long are they here, right? You know, how many RV guys are short-term rental? Maybe it's zero. Well, that's very helpful to know what kind of congestion you might have for those rigs on the, on the road. And, and the other part is just relative to, from an economic modeling perspective, you know, what's that mix of rental? Because that affects us as the town from the standpoint of uh, rental revenue. It's one of our biggest uh, revenue generators that we have, you know, because that should be included in the model as, as, a, as a positive impact, not only for the county, but for the town since we get a portion of, yeah, room tax. Yeah, thank you. And then I think the other part is from a viability perspective, there's been a, all sorts of data, um, you know, actually most recently in the Wall Street Journal this past, uh, this, um, uh, past uh, within the last six months, I believe, you know, talked about, you know, the RV industry overall had a little bit of a hiccup in 2019, you know, over capacity, you know, over estimating how much, you know, economic growth to drive by RV purchases because RVs is uh, the really, you know, canary in the coal mine relative to the economic activity in, in the country relative to how they spend their money, at least as portrayed in the Wall Street Journal article. Um, and the, and, but that's RVs in general. And the question is, you know, what detailed data do you have about the Class A market? Because the RV, RVIA has, has economic impact, you know, very similar to tourism in the state of Wisconsin. RVIA has done that for the RV industry and to show the impact. But, you know, you know there's some data that suggests that the Class A market is, is uh, has gone down compared to the other RV markets, which has been driven by millennials, which has grown. And I think that's the Wall Street Journal article was talking about the millennials are camping more than you know their mom and dads have, which is kind of interesting. So the question is, what's happening from a Class A perspective? Because your upper limit of the age group you're talking about, they're three years from dying. <laughs> okay. So if you look at if you look at the life expectancy, seventy it's seventy eight. That's what you really think, you. It's seventy eight. I'm just being honest here. I'm sorry. This is the marketing guy in me coming out. It it's seventy eight years old, right? And you're talking about you know fifty five to seventy five, and so they you know they there's there's. I hope they're I I hope that guy that's you know seventy seven and eleven months years old is not driving on the drive, um, you know. Uh, when his time comes up to be 78. So, so I think that's a question relative to what is the viability, you know, from a long-term perspective? Because I think, you know, having worked in the, in the Milwaukee area for a while, we've all seen relative to how uh, a company, a well-known, well-respected company that relies on baby boomers is having tough times, and that's Harley-Davidson. Yeah. And so when you look at that marketplace that you're serving with that demographic, and you look at the struggles that Harley is doing, trying to convert, it'd be interesting to see how are millennials migrating to, to, to the Class A RV, right? And are you gonna continue to have a robust market? I mean, there's no argument that, that the folks that you're catering to today, they got money to spend and having, you know, lived through all the Harley Fest in Milwaukee, I mean, you know, the money flows, you know, like the Nile River, but, you know, that river may dry up, and the question is, from your economic impact long term, how is that viable? Because you don't want to have a ghost town, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Wait, are you having a problem hearing in the back row again? Yes? All right, so bring those microphones up nice and Sorry. close. So I think from an economic impact, I think um, the, the tourism impact is, isn't stated uh, well. Maybe that new report can shed some light, you know, that talks about this notion of direct, indirect, and a kind of induced... Uh, you know benefits because it's it's not it's not small and I think that's something that and the, and what that means for uh, our rental you know tax and room tax benefits to the, to the town and I think the other thing is just from a str str strategic perspective 
is it viable long term when you think of uh, other industries and markets, you know, like Harley, et cetera, that are in that age demographic, and does that provide s some risk that you just you just need to think about in your plan? Thank you. My turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I only have two questions. Um, so when it comes to your infrastructure and financing that, have you sent some feelers out? Are you going to require a certain number or a certain dollar amount of pre-sales before you start on the infrastructure? No, we're not, we're not going to require pre-sales before we start on the infrastructure. We have no plans of requiring any pre-sales. The, uh, um, the people that finance these types of deals are typically people who are also enthusiasts themselves and um, have the capacity. They, they understand the market. They understand the development. They understand the, the, the whole picture, the, the big picture of it. Um, as far as uh, the... Uh, the, the, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, can you rephrase your question? Or, I mean, well, my question was, in order to install your infrastructure, mm -hmm. the topsoil, the mm -hmm. laterals, whatever, your holding tanks, um, the roadways, mm -hmm. the landscaping, you said all of that would be in place right. before you start selling. Right. So do you, have you put feelers out there on to potential owners, or it sounds like you have private financers that are prepared to do all of that before you even start selling. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, in a case like this, it, it pretty much has to go that way. I mean, it's, um, okay. uh, again, the, the infrastructure will be in place. I don't know, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, the one thing, to get an occupancy permit for those homes, the infrastructure would have to be in place as far as the uh, all the utilities. So the only you can't really do part of it, so the entire holding tank wells, um, infrastructure would have to be completed before any occupancy takes place. Will there be marketing done as this construction mm -hmm. is taking place? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, would they be considered pre-sales? I, I don't really know exactly how that would be handled, but yes, if somebody wants to put money down, um, looking at other developments throughout the country, there is money put down on these type of developments prior to occupancy or purchase. Because one of the questions that the RPC will address is, whether and in what amount and form financial financial assurance is necessary, so you're prepared to submit all I, that to the well. Again, you know, it's going to be private, privately funded. There won't be no public input. I mean, public money spent. And I believe that might have been stricken from the uh, from the uh, RPC. One of the uh, items that they're going to be asking. I think that might have been just recently stricken. I'm looking at their criteria for conditional use permit from June of 2018, and it's on there, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. It's if, it is, the if, it's, if it's required, we yeah. will be pre okay. preparing for it, um, yes. And my second question is on the well. The uh, staff report from the county indicated it would be served by two high-capacity wells. Did you just say, or um, did you indicate something different, Mr. Hurth? Uh, no, it uh, high capacity is if you're at 70 gallons a minute or more, they consider that a high capacity mm -hmm. site. So this will be a other than municipal public well, also high capacity because it's <laughs> over 70 gallons. Okay, because usually high capacity is 100,000 gallons, right? Um, it's based on gallons per minute. Per day. So if you're over okay. 69 gallons a minute from the aquifer, that's when it kicks you in to a high capacity site. Okay. <coughs> Mm. Well, yes, yeah, I get. I are you saying? I guess uh, maybe I'm missing the picture here, but you're not going to Microphone. you're not going to see any money until you sell the first unit. Mm -hmm. You have to expend a lot of money. This is the old bookkeeper in me. You got to expend a lot. Of, are you set up for that? From a sequence of events standpoint, sir, we, we have you know spoken with people, money people, we have people that are very interested. But from a sequence of events standpoint, you have to get your permitting in place so you have right. nothing to sell. You have nothing to talk about. You're wasting everybody's time. 
So yeah, again, you, you know, you, you you have people that are that are interested, people that are very interested, but again, we don't have anything really, you know, to, to I show. I guess that. the thought was is that you start a project that you run out of money because you didn't get, you know, secured it, finances or something that is a concern. It, sure, no, I understand that. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to put a shovel in the ground in a case like this right. with a massive infrastructure that's required up front without a full commitment you know, to, to do that and patient capital to hold. Right. Or else it doesn't pay. Yeah. You know, you just, then the other thing, yeah. kind of on a little bit about what uh, Mr. Zettel said, <clears throat> or going on that, it's to be set up, should you get the green light, it's to be set up as a condominium set up. Often, when a condominium is whatever, 50% uh, built, I don't know, 70% makes no difference. The developer backs out and the owners take over. Now, when or if that would occur, and however the owner organization is set up, you, you have now certain house designs, certain uh, uh, specs, et cetera, et cetera, that the owners would need to. Okay, let's just hypothetically say you then, um, it's your time to turn it over to the owners, whatever the percentage is. 75. What is the guarantee? Because I know that owner associations can change bylaws or and or their the, the group, the owner's association versus a board of directors and who has what, can change rules and regs, can change uh, bylaws. So I guess the thing in the section where you had all this particulars in the bylaws, let's say they all decide they want wood fireplaces or wood pits or um, they all vote for, I don't know, um, putting a diving board on a Sure. A, a pond, I, who knows what. It can be anything, believe me, I know. What assurances, you know, <laughs> the, the, way, what the way you can Canada do. The way law works, to, quickly here, basically, at 75% of sellout, the, yeah, at 75% of sellout, the a developer has to turn control of the property over to the association. Mm -hmm. The um, oftentimes the developer will retain a seat on the board uh, because simply because you know well for a lot of reasons. But at any rate, um, as far as changing the law, the developers long gone. The place is built out. Do they want to change the law? There are certain, and again, I'm not an attorney, but there are certain changes that require a hundred percent agreement, mm -hmm. which you'll never get. Okay, there are certain changes that require seventy-five percent. In certain two-thirds. Yeah, that yeah, those I'm, I'm not I'm aware, aware. But, but maybe there are. At any rate, even seventy-five percent is very, very hard to get. As far as an additional layer, we'll use the wood fires as an example. That can be a condition that's placed on the property as as a, as a condition of receiving the permit. It's in effect similar to a deed restriction in that. It's not going to be changed unless you can get the county to go along with it, which yeah. I highly doubt would happen. Yeah. So that, those, that, I guess that's the best I can do. I just know that there's a lot of flexibility amongst homeowners after the developer. Once the done. conditional use permit is, uh, is uh, approved, we can't change even if there's a vote of the owners. It, those conditions are placed on this for the entire development okay. unless we go back and get a new conditional use okay. permit. We've run Good. into that before. Right. And those conditional use... Um, permit conditions follow the land as right. long as that exactly. business is operating those yep. conditional use conditions will remain with that parcel unless it's discon Correct. discontinued. Any other questions from the commission? All right, then um, we will have, oh, we want a break? Well, I don't know. Yes, you said earlier we might have one. All right, we'll take a short break. We'll take uh, no more than five minutes. Alrighty. Not on the bed.